that's why this. So as part of this, we actually opened up a second workshop, as I said, which will be in November. And we also are going to have two, at least two, and probably three or four in-person roadshows uh, and workshops in West Africa, which Elliot is is working really hard to to organize, and um, and at least one other one, and perhaps two in, in East Africa. So um, it's really my pleasure. I haven't introduced myself. My name is. Uh, Musa Mshanga. Um, I'm a uh, professor at the Radboud Institute of Molecular Life Sciences in the Netherlands. And um, our lab works a lot in single cell biology, but mainly in, in the area of chromatin and gene regulation. Um, for this conversation, I'm also speaking on behalf of the HCA's equity working group and as a member of the HCA organizing committee. Um, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how we've worked really hard to bring equity at the center of many of the efforts we are trying to do at the HCA. So I'm just gonna share my screen in one moment. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, it's not in presenter view though. Oh, and now? Yes. Great. Perfect. Okay. All right, so our um, equity working group is led by myself, um, Alex Shalek at MIT and Parta Majumdar at, uh, in India. And essentially, we've been working for the last uh, four years on building up the equity working group. And we represent a, a very diverse membership from around the world who really guides and advises the, the HCA leadership around issues of equity and trying to enlarge the scope and participation of people um, from various backgrounds around the world in the HCA effort. And so we'll talk to you a little bit about that today and, and, and sort of weave it into the HCA mission. So what is, what is the HCA mission really? And that mission is to create a comprehensive atlas of the types and properties of all human cells since they are the fundamental unit of life. And this unit can be at this level when it's analyzed can be used as a basis for understanding and diagnosing, monitoring and treating health and disease. And what we've come to realize over nearly 50 years of cell and molecular biology is that actually by understanding cells, we really are looking at a periodic table of life. Put another way, as we know, chemistry and the chemistry periodic table was able to reduce the elements into their atomized parts. Likewise, understanding the biology of our cells or human cells at the single cell level atomizes this fundamental unit of life to individual cells and really catalogs them in a very similar way to what we would see in the periodic table. And so, you can imagine that being able to understand the, these fundamental units enables us to assemble these fundamental units into something that eventually is a tissue. Now, if you take this a little bit further over the HCA timeline, really it's about technology. And technology has made this really possible for us to be able to dissect cells into single units. And one of our co-leaders, Alex Shalik, when he was in the laboratory of Avi Vergev, who leads the HCA, him and other colleagues were able to do the first experiments where they were able to untangle this fundamental unit of life, but only looking at a few hundred cells. We've come an extremely long way since that time in 2000, 
2014 and 2015, where now we can dissect millions of cells at a time in a single experiment. And this just points to the really explosive growth of the technology associated with being able to dissect this fundamental unit of life at this scale. So this led to the launching of the human cell atlas as a sort of counterpart to the human genome project where we would catalog all the cells in the human body. And that began with a meeting in October, 2016 at the Wellcome Trust where myself and Alex were participated and it was led by Aviva Gevin, about a hundred other scientists from around the world to really kick off and launch phase zero of the HCA project. We then went on to create multiple types of groups and the DCP, which coordinates the data coordination committee and protocols was launched soon afterwards in 2016 and the, in 2017. And then we started to have different, excuse me, members joined from around the world who had essentially decided to, to focus on tissue-based projects. And so, as you can see in this timeline, this has led to the development of meetings in different parts of the world, which have brought scientists together to build atlases on different tissues from different diverse parts of the world, leading right up to 2019, where we had our first kind of outside Europe and the United States efforts, where we, myself and Alex Shalik and Jonah Cole from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative were able to go to Latin America and start to really forcefully push for more inclusion and equity from outside the major research centers in the world. And that led to a meeting in September that was hosted by our colleagues in Brazil who really nucleated a large set of um, you know, collaborative networks that has come to be known as HCA Latin America. Now, unfortunately, the pandemic didn't do us any favors and we couldn't have been able to meet in person for the last two or three years. But during that time, we've tried our utmost to be able to keep the fire burning around this. And that's really led us to where we are now in the first Africa meeting, which was early this year in March. And that really, um, under the leadership of uh, our advisory committee from Gordon Alandare, and with the participation of many scientists around the continent who are interested in single cell biology, we were able to hold a, a virtual workshop over two days, which was really outstanding and had you know, several African countries and institutes participating. And that was our first major push of many pushes that we would have in Africa. So over these two years, the initiative has rapidly grown as you can see here, we now have participation from 83 different countries and over a thousand institutes with over 2000 members. And I think this just shows one of the core components of the way that the HCA initiative and the building of the Atlas is occurring in a far more diverse and equitable manner than probably any uh, large scale consortium in the life sciences today. So talking about this global network, as I mentioned, um, we established the HCA Asia network quite early and then went on to establish the HCA Latin American network, which has over uh, 90 members, almost 100 members and covers eight countries. Of course, Latin America is much smaller. And in the last two years, we've made a lot of effort to try to establish a re regional networks in Africa. Um, governing about 12 countries. And this particular workshop is really part of the um, effort to build the fundamental skill sets that are necessary to work with single cell data. I'll be at this time in RNA-seq and we hope to extend that to other parts of single cell biology, including um, spatial transcriptomics. So, the HCA is compartmentalized in two biological networks where each of the major tissues 
and organs are broken down into biological networks by expertise. And this small table here shows um, the coordinators of each of these networks. And for those of you who are participating in this workshop and are working in specific areas related to these organs, whether you're working on healthy tissues and fundamental questions or in diseases that target one or more of these organs, I think I would encourage you to reach out to these biological networks and see the different ways in which your research or your work, current work could, could really dovetail with some of the activities that are occurring within these different networks. And I think it's really important for um, institutions in Africa to present their most important issues and their most important research questions in the ways that they would gain the greatest benefit from using the Atlas around these different biological networks. Um, so these multiple research areas and biological networks have produced vast amounts of data. A lot of it in ca cataloging from healthy tissues, really the, the most interesting, let's call it questions, and usually fundamental questions to the scientists working in these areas. However, um, we all know that really the healthy atlas is of sort of our reference versus disease. And the problem is, and I really think of this as a really big problem, is that the reference is only being taken from Europe and the United States in the vast majority. And I think it's really important that we in Africa build our own reference atlases, which are based on our own tissues. And we do this in Africa with skill sets that are being brought to this problem by people in Africa. This really fundamental and bottoms up approach will enable us to get the maximal benefit from projects such as the human cell atlas. So as much as we've sampled 8,000 individuals and looked at 53 million cells so far, a very small fraction of these are from people in Africa. And if you were to break that down into different organ tissues through the biological networks, this is what you would see. And I think in the future, we would like you know, a very significant number of these efforts and these biological networks to really be well permeated by researchers from around Africa. And so these different biological networks really need the active participation of all of you who are working at the front line of this field to really participate in and be able to contribute not only data and analysis, but also help to nucleate networks within your countries and within your scientific communities around these different biological networks. Today, obviously, you're sort of in the learning phase, but you know, you're all very smart people. And I'm sure that within a very short period of time, you'll be working with primary data quite soon. So we have partnerships across many programs, um, not only in Healthy Atlas, but I think what the COVID-19 pandemic really showed us is that having disease atlases are, is of utmost importance. And related to that, I think what we've been able to see is that being during the COVID pandemic, building atlases from COVID patients and comparing those to the healthy atlas that we had from the lung atlas or other different tissues has been really helpful in diagnostics and therapeutic approaches. And so um, that has led to many different efforts. I'm sorry, I don't know why this isn't stopping, but essentially there are many different efforts to build disease atlases from the NIH from in Europe from consortium called Lifetime of the Master Cancer Institute in the United States, and also from many other institutions. So one of the key things I think we've tried to do in terms of promoting equity and participation from different parts of the world is very early in the creation of the HCA, 
working groups are created. And one of the first working groups created was an equity working group. And this was really to promote and support progress towards equity by engaging the entire global community. Most of that community in science has really focused historically only on Europe and the United States and very marginally on Asia. And our goal was really to transcend the geographic limitations of this that I've mentioned earlier, but also to try to span other axes, including gender, which is another one that has always been biased towards male genders, age, to really try to sample across multiple ages, socioeconomic status, something that also gets ignored quite significantly, when, even when we work in different geographies. Importantly, this has to result in and promote equal benefit. And this is why I emphasize so deeply that equal benefit can only come if we really have very well-trained people across all of these axes, because people who are within those groups can really know what will benefit the group the best. And so we need to empower their participation. We need to do more outreach, education and training, just as we are doing uh, during this, this particular workshop. So one of the things that we are very committed to is working in underrepresented countries, particularly LMICs, we also are working hard to really have metrics around our participation and the things that we work on in these different initiatives of the Equity Working Group and the HCA, including in publication, sample participation, participation in biological networks, and also in workshops such as these, having clear metrics as to how we are expanding the equitable, part, equitable participation of different groups. We also have worked a lot with funders to really isolate and earmark funds and make those available specifically for um, equity initiatives and to have programs such as these, not only virtually, but also in person. And also depending on the geographies, we really are working very hard to provide different levels of financial support to, to participate in such training workshops. The HCA also has a general meeting, which we just had in, in Vienna. And during those meetings, we put aside and earmark specific funds for the participation of people from you know, all LMIC countries. So going forward and with the sort of opening up in the post-pandemic world, we really would like to lead what we would call our hybrid workshops. This is sort of, a the best we can do in the kind of early post-pandemic period but we'd like to have these sorts of workshops uh, occurring in um, how shall we say like in person and also uh, in hybrid formats where people who are not necessarily there in person can participate so we've had a number of success stories that we'd like to highlight um, and First of all, at the highest level around the globe, we've had you know, the emergence of these three regional networks, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Asia being the most mature, and you know, I think Africa, unfortunately, we haven't had the, the same um, timeline on participation in Africa, especially in person as we've had in the other two geographies. I think the first meeting that we had this year in March was a success and there's a number of people on, on this call and in this program who contributed tremendously to that, including Christine. And we would like to keep that going strongly. Um, earlier this month, we had a Latin American symposium, um, which is a different format that's actually presenting of data from different researchers from around Latin America. And we're having, I think, the fourth or fifth HCA Asia um, in, in uh, November this year. So um, we've had support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, as I mentioned earlier, to do these, to do actual workshops. 
And these involve single cell data analysis and single cell transcriptomics. And we've had workshops in Latin America where we had 24 countries participating. And, as, and that was last year in April, but we've also had them in India virtually earlier this year um, with similar goals in single cell transcriptomics. And of course, today we're having similar one beginning here in virtually in, in West Africa. So this is just a description of really what we are planning to do over this workshop. And I think it's really important to, to understand that these are quite complex things for us to do virtually. And um, I really, at this moment in time, I really wanna point out the efforts of Elliot Bobbitt, who Elliot is, is, works very closely with um, Alex Shalik. And not only is this virtual you know, workshop and training event occurring to be able to support training in these events, but she's also working very, very, very hard for us to do two in-person workshops for the first time in West Africa in early next year. And I think um, for us to mobilize, you know, scientists from her lab, scientists from other labs, our lab, um, to, to participate and to be able to go to these different parts of Africa is, is really, really um, no, small, no small feat. So one of the things I think is really important for us to all understand is that we believe, we want to hear from you. We want to listen to the feedback we get from you of how beneficial and how useful the things we are doing are. This is really important. And also more than anything else we'd like to know, I think I'd like to know this part first, is the things we're doing wrong. How, what are we doing wrong? What, where are our shortcomings? And, and in what ways do you think we could correct those? And I think um, we want to engage in projects like the HCA for the benefit of humanity. And we've kind of written this, these pieces in Nature and in other journals, sort of outlining in, in different levels of detail how we see the HCA can, can be beneficial to humanity. However, as we go along in this, these missions of workshops and symposiums and, and you know, large scale international scientific collaboration, it's really important that all this outreach, we pay attention and listen to our audience and listen to the people we participate in this with and really create the conditions in, under which we can be accepting and, and sort of open to criticism and to praise. And so um, as you go through this, please feel free to reach out to myself and other people to let us know how we're doing, let us know what we're doing, you know, where we're falling down and not perhaps could do better. And also let us know what we're doing right. So we can consolidate on those things, especially in this type of course. The hardest thing in these virtual environments is to actually know when something's working and not working. And I think um, for all of you who are who are going to be students of this, that's for me as a, as a professor, and as a teacher, that's almost the hardest thing to know at this distance. So I'd encourage you as part of our success story to help us learn about our failures. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your partnership. And these are the people who support our work in HCA, especially in equity. And I hope all of you are able to really have a great time, have lots of fun learning about um, single cell RNA-seq techniques. Thank you. Thank you so much, Musa. Um, great talk. Are there any questions for Musa? You're welcome to write your questions either in the chat 
or um, if you want to raise your hand or just start speaking, please, this is uh, very participatory. So any questions? <clears throat> thank you for participating. You know, thank you. Olokoyade. Sorry, I probably didn't pronounce your name properly, but thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Yeah, so um, if if there are no questions or if uh, a question uh, comes to your mind for Musa later, you're welcome to just send yeah. it or um, I can connect you with Musa directly. Um, or you have a reminder, is it or? Yes, or do you want to? Yes, so Musa just uh, put his email address in the chat. So you're welcome to, to reach out to Musa and I'm sure that he'll get back to you. Um, as soon as he is able to. Um, so, or you wanted to take a group picture, is that right? Yeah, group photo while we have Musa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, or, commemorate the Zoom era. <laughs> so I know some folks awesome. have bandwidth issues. Um, if you're able to really quickly to take yourself off of, uh, if you're able to put yourself on camera so we can take a group picture, yes. that's great. We'll make it. Yes, we'll let's have it. everybody's uh, let's have everybody's picture up. That would be great. Or video, sorry, if you can. <laughs> you might have to take it in multiple multiple um screens. Or some, we'll do some stitching we'll from do the space from the spatial transcript of McDonald's. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly right. Let's do some stitching. Okay, so I'm um, okay. So I'm gonna screenshot. So smile, everyone. Okay, and then I'm gonna go to the next. Group. <laughs> so if people can continue taking, keeping their cameras on, I'm gonna grab some other folks. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, okay, everyone here, please smile. Excellent. Okay. Or I was able to, to grab a couple of screenshots. Um, so hopefully we got something <laughs> we can work with. <laughs> Feels like the deeper pages have less video somehow. So <laughs> at least for me. Anyway, it's been a pleasure meeting everybody and good luck with the course. Um, please reach out to me by email if you want to follow up scientifically very happy on equity issues also very happy and the best of luck take care thank ciao. you uh, ciao thank you all righty um i believe our next speaker is daniela russo uh, so daniela i will turn it over to you awesome thank you let me just get this all set up Let's go back a few more slides. Does this look okay to everyone? It looks great. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Uh, so I am Daniela. Uh, I am going to be leading our intro. I work in Alex Shalik's lab, uh, doing a lot of the bioinformatics aspects, and as well as a lot of the wet lab uh, aspects of single cell RNA sequencing. So I'm really excited to be here and share a little bit about uh, single cell with everyone. For the overall goals of not just this lecture, but through the uh, entirety of these next few days, what the main focuses are being is to provide an introduction to the rapidly expanding world of single cell transcriptomics with less of a focus on specific tools, but more understanding the underlying concepts that are involved. And so that way, after this is done, you're going to have enough information to make informed choices that are specific to your work and to your experiments. Uh, the hands-on labs will be looking at single cell data um, that will be introduced a little bit later. And then overall, just making sure that we're all going to have fun, learn, collaborate, and uh, interact over the next week or the next few days. Uh, just a few course expectations. 
If you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand or just to put the question in the chat box on Zoom. If it's not a portion where you need to ask a question, if we can keep muted um, just that way to make sure there's no noise interference. And if we do run out of time or you find that you have a question after a lecture or after the course, please feel free to use the Slack. I believe everyone's been invited at this point. Um, and then please be patient if there are technical issues. I think that we're used to this in the Zoom era, but just in case we never know what happens. Um, and so just to introduce Slack in case anyone has never used it or hasn't uh, been or invited at this point, to use Slack, if you just Google slack.com and you go to the downloads page, it will actually pull up a download link that's specific to your OS. So whether you're using Windows or Mac, there will be a version. And once it's downloaded and you boot it up and sign in, all of that kind of fun stuff, uh, we should all be added to the HCA group. And so in this group, it's gonna work like any type of chat medium where you can search a person's name and you can then send them a direct message. There are also these channels. So if we see this image uh, all the way to the left, there's one that's called HCA Africa attendees. And so everyone will be added to that group and it's gonna provide a really good forum to ask questions to us, but also to just propose questions that can be answered by the community. And that is where we're hoping to also um, engage with one another and collaborate. But that's for Slack and all of that kind of good intro. Um, now we'll move into actually discussing a little bit more of single cells and that's starting with the cells themselves. And so the cell is a fundamental unit of tissue and has a lot of diversity that are driven by tons of different cellular features. So if we think about a certain cell type, uh, we can think about a hemopoietic stem cell or a T cell. And thinking about that T cell, you know, sometimes it's circulating in the bloodstream, sometimes at the germinal uh, center. And we can look to say, is this T cell naive? It hasn't seen any antigen, or is this now a memory T cell? what are these different types of cell divisions and what type of transcriptional changes lead from one cell type to another cell type. Single cell genomics has really, oops, sorry. So single cell genomics has really allowed for a comprehensive profiling of these molecular processes of cells and help us define healthy and diseased behaviors. Uh, so while there are several methods that have been developed to characterize different aspects of single cells, such as using uh, cell, cell surface proteins with FACS or chromatin with ChIP-seq, there's been a significant focus on mRNA since it's relatively easy to capture and can be used to explore everything that a cell aspires to do at a given moment. And so here I'm outlining just a few different types of mRNA tools, um, and these can be used to analyze the transcriptome, revealing important information about the genome, giving insights into cell types and cell states, and then in turn characterizing distinct cell types that can elucidate cell populations and cell-to-cell -cell interactions that play important roles in both development and in disease. And so what we can see is that single cell RNA sequencing has been rapidly evolving. It's the uh, most mature single cell genomics and we can just see that there's been incredible growth in both the different techniques as well as the different ways of processing. And so we started in 2009 with very manual processing and moved into the ability to use liquid handling. Um, so using different types of liquid handling robots and now looking into things like pico wells and in situ barcoding. To begin, before we start looking at these different techniques, it's also really good to understand bulk versus single cell RNA sequencing. And so when we think about uh, a sample, we think about a tissue and we can process that tissue as the cell mixture using bulk RNA sequencing, but it's going to provide us with an average expression level, and it's not going to tell us much 
in terms of looking at the nitty gritty in this heterogeneous system. However, single cell RNA sequencing can break down the spectrum by enabling the dissection of gene expression at a single cell level. And so this can help to reveal complex and rare cell populations, uncover regulatory relationships and track the trajectories of distinct cell lineages in development. There is a general workflow that all of the different methods will follow, and it's a general process that can be thought of for these high throughput single cell RNA sequencing workflows. Beginning with a heterogeneous sample, we remove DNA, protein, and cellular debris in order to isolate the mRNA. And then we reverse transcribe and barcode this cDNA library. The library can then be sequenced and it'll yield millions of reads or genes, which can then be mapped to a reference genome and further analyzed. The main point of the differences for many of the high throughput methods is how this library itself is generated. So there's many different types of methods to generate these libraries. And a lot of these different methods can be categorized on different levels. One of those levels being the method of isolation. So are we going to pre-sort our cells using something like facts? Are we going to use droplets and or are we going to use nano wells? So in terms of something like all of these fax methods, there's only one type of single cell method currently that gives us real full length gene coverages. And this is our plate based method that's known as SmartSeq2. And so if we think about SmartSeq2, it has about an 80% capacity uh, capture efficiency has very good cell capture. And again, it provides these full length transcripts. It is slightly more expensive at a dollar per cell. It's much more labor intensive and slow and costly. It's more used if you only have a couple hundreds of cells, maybe to a few, few thousands. Um, again, because each well of either a 96 or a 384 well plate is going to contain a single cell, which will then be further processed to form those libraries, which I was mentioning before. SmartSeq2 has also recently got a little bit of an upgrade in 2020 and a little bit further even this year alone um, with the addition of things like SmartSeq3. And so they're still very, very similar. And so I'm going to put them beside each other um, and talk a little bit about both, but they're incredibly similar. And I'll mention what the main difference is towards the end. Um, but basically in the, at the SmartSeq world of processing samples, we will first lyse the cells in a solution with DNTPs as well as oligonucleotides. And these will then uh, be responsible for priming our lysed cells and also adding uh, onto the polyadenylate, polyadenylated RNA sequences. There will then be template switching using an oligo, which is known as a template switching oligo that has locked nucleic acids uh, at the TSO3 prime end. So it will add these Gs on the, or it has Gs on the ends, which will then add a template that can be noticed and recognized by some ISPCRs um, during, the pre uh, during the amplification phase. And later on, we will then move down into the tagmentation. And so in SmartSeq2, the tagmentation uses a TN5 transposase that catalyzes in vitro integration of predetermined oligonucleotides. Um, this is different than in SmartSeq3, where the TSO is more, it has a TN5 transposase in that reverse transcription, that first step. And that's needed because during that reverse transcription, we will also get what are known as UMIs, which I will discuss um, in the next slide. But basically, once we have done these tagmentation steps, we are ready to sequence these libraries using different Illumina sequencers. And then where we will see the biggest differences between something like SmartSeq2 and SmartSeq3 is post-sequencing, where we will get these internal reads from both SmartSeq2 and SmartSeq3, and those again are those 
full length reads. But with SmartSeq 3, we will also get these five prime UMI reads. And so I keep using this term UMI. And to make, uh, so basically what that is, is that they are unique molecular identifiers. So they can sometimes be called UMIs or UMIs. Um, it's completely personal preference on how we reference them, but they mean a short uh, bar random barcode that we add to our transcripts during a reverse transcription stage for certain single cell processing methods. They enable sequencing reads to be assigned to individual mo transcript molecules, and thus it helps with the removal of amplification noise and biases from single cell RNA-seq data. So they're complex indices that are added before any PCR amplification ha happens, and en it enables more accurate bioinformatic identification when we start to do some analyses of the data. What's important to note is that uh, these early labelings will help with correction, but they don't help or they don't correct for low capture rates. And so we want to make sure that we are using these UMEs for what they are um, and understanding where they can help and where they have still some shortcomings. Um, and then, that's, you know, the gist of our plate-based methods. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has any questions at this point, um, but if you do, please let me know in the chat or put your hand up. Um, and I will move on to our next type of method, which is the droplet isolation. And so this helps with some higher throughput work. And so when we think about droplet isolation, so methods, Daniela, we really Daniela, there Sorry. is a question from Louise Afrin. Oh. Um, she's asking what Sorry. do you mean by false negatives? Yeah, so for sure. Um, so when we think about our template switching, sometimes there are the way that, uh, sorry, let me see the best way if I have an image to show. I don't believe I do. Sorry, I, it's usually uh, more under, I can add an image later into our Slack, um, but false negatives are just when we have this template switching that sometimes what is reverse transcribed isn't necessarily um, the entirety of the gene. And so when we see these abundances, they're not always representative. And so sometimes we can use bioinformatic methods to look to see which our uh to see like our actual rates of capture um as well as what are genes and what are things that just need to be removed um i don't know if anyone has anything that they want to add um in terms of the training team and what is the importance of tagmentation uh, so again, this results or this kind of relates a little bit. And so we want to make sure that our tagmentation when we are actually, uh, so when we're tagmenting these sequences, we want to make sure that they're going to be recognized by later steps in the process. And so we want to make sure that they're going to have some stable structures that they are going to be able to be recognized in our PCRs or in our uh, later steps. And so tagmentation tends to be quite important, um, especially in SmartSeq. Um, is that, does that answer the question or did you, would you like any additional explanation on that? Awesome, great. Um, and again, I'll try to find a good image for false negatives in SmartSeq. Um, it will do a lot more justice than me trying to talk about it. Um, and I can also add that into the Slack. So the next type of isolation is known as droplet methods. And so many of the current high throughput methods uh, tend to be droplet based. And so when we think of the major droplet based or the more heavily used droplet based methods, we think about DropSeq, InDrop, and 10x. 
DropSeq uses a microfluidic device where individual cells and microparticles are responsible for de delivering barcoded primers at a low density and they randomly encapsulate a droplet that some number of droplets will contain both one cell and one bead. After lysis and hybridization, we obtain a set of beads that are called single cell transcriptomes attached to microparticles, which also is known as stamps. So these stamps can be sub subsequently reverse transcribed, amplified, and pulled for sequencing, very similar to the way that was shown in SmartSeq. Um, of course, the chemistry is a little bit different, but a lot of the principles still hold true. Indrop expands on this technology, but instead they use hydro, uh, hydrogel beads, and then 10x chromium uses a more gel-like bead that contains barcodes, which can dissolve in the droplet. All three of the workflows generate droplets that can accommodate single cell reactions and then ascribe the information to the cell using these barcoded stamps. Um, but there are important considerations to think about for each method. Mostly a lot of these drop seek type methods have a lot of clinical complications in some senses. Um, and again, choosing a method is going to be completely dependent on which are with your questions that you're asking, as well as things like scalability, portability, etc. cetera. Uh, so the most obvious difference is the low capture efficiency of drop seek. With the emulsions happening, you'll end up with lots of droplets, but a lot of these droplets won't contain anything. And so very few droplets will have that one bead, one cell property that we're looking for. And so for this reason, um, a lot of these cells and beads are only randomly encapsulated and it's hard to distinguish. Another common issue in terms of scalability occurs in the case where you have a fresh sample such as a cancer biopsy when you don't want to waste the cells and so something like drop seek or in drop are going to be less ideal because they have lower capture efficiencies on the other hand 10x has a really great capture efficiency but uh, what tends to happen with 10x is that the more samples that are accumulated the more the reagent costs tend to become expensive and that can sometimes become a little bit prohibit, uh, prohibiting. So the goal that you want to find is something that is going to be more cost effective, but also has this good capture efficiency um, if your sample deems necessary. Uh, one way that we can think about cost efficiency and capture efficiency is using something like nano wells. Um, which is where we will discuss SQL. The data that we'll be using um, to do some analyses for the remainder of this course was generated using SQL. And so in SQL, we really are trying to optimize uh, using single cell with low input samples. And so due to the low efficiency and encapsulation that we see in a lot of the droplet-based techniques, rather than trying to capture cells or barcoding bees using droplets, the alternative here is to use an array that has a set of little boxes which act as compartments for both the beads and the cells. And this enables us to do uh, something very simply with gravity where we will allow these beads to just basically drop into these sub nanoliter wells. And these wells will only accommodate one bead and then that, so we have a loading efficiency for the beads of approximately 95%. After that, we load the cells in a very similar manner and it enables a capture efficiency of about 80%, which is very in line with what we saw with something like SmartSeq 2. Also, another advantage of SQL is its portability. So you only need a few items, namely an array, a pipette, a, a clamp, an oven and a tube rotator. And once you have all of these, um, it becomes quite easy to, or you know, it allows you to be able to use this technology almost anywhere. At a high level, a lot of the similar the methods here are similar, or a lot of the steps involved are similar to other single cell methods that we've talked about previously. 
um, but I'm going to just mention a few key elements that make this methodology more unique. So with SQL, cells are extracted and dissociated from your sample using a protocol that has been pre that has been documented or that has been created and known to work. Um, and instead of loading the beads and cells onto something like a 10x device, we're going to drop them over this micro well of ray that's been functionalized. The wells will again accommodate one bead and one cell. And then the array will be sealed using a, a chemically functionalized semi-permeable polycarbonate membrane. And this is one of the key features of SQL that it allow, allows cell lysis and facilitates buffers to be exchanged freely across the array um, while still blocking other biological macromolecules. And it's been seen to improve transcript capture as well as reduce cross-contamination. So after lysis, uh, the bead bounded polyoligonucleotides that will contain a universal primer, a cell barcode, and one of these UMIs that we mentioned previously. And this will then help in capture, capturing cellular mRNA. So then the membrane is peeled off, the beads are removed from the array, and bulk reverse transcription, amplification, and library preparation will occur uh, to create the uh, sequencing libraries. And so um, to be a little bit more thorough, this is what the uh, sequence will look like. So when we are doing that reverse transcription, we will generate the cDNA and it's done by incubating the mixture which includes a, a different template switching oligo. Um, and this will create a universal priming site for PCR amplification at the pre three prime end, and thus will hybridize to the five prime untemplated C bases to create full length cDNA synthesis and amplification. After that, uh, in order to remove excess primer, we will use an exonuclease treatment and further, we will, uh, sometimes during our reverse transcription, we will get template switching um, that, again, isn't necessarily the exact way we want it to be done. Um, so in certain cases, there's an absence of these trailing Cs, where, which prevent the template switching oligo from binding to the cDNA and consequently uh, reverse transcription doesn't occur. So to improve this, SQL also does what is uh, does a step which we call the second strand synthesis. And this incorporates a DN smart primer to bind to parts of the cDNA and recover those lost transcripts. After that, we then continue with a very similar process to something like SmartSeq2, where we're going to um, amplify the whole transcriptome using PCR. And so this is using the double-stranded DNA with the universal primer sequence for amplification. We amplify the product using an ISPCR primer, um, and then we will run a PCR, and the number of cycles will depend very heavily on the sample type. But once we've completed that and we have cleaned our PCR product using Ampure spry beads at various volumetric ratios, uh, we will quantify the amount of product we've created and then we will prep for our sequencing libraries. And so to do this, we will use um, an Illumina kit that will take on universal Illumina adapters um, and so basically the, there will be a P7 primer that anneals to the three prime end and a P5 primer that anneals to the five prime end. And the, these will both be transposes that add uh, adapters that are both random and essential for Illumina sequencing. And this basically will let us run these samples on any Illumina machine. So whether it's a MySeq or a NextSeq or a NovaSeq, et cetera. And so this data can be sequenced and then quality controlled and analyzed. In this 
image, we are showing a TISNI plot, which tends to be a very common analysis tool for RNA sequencing. And so this is to say that there are many different types of single cell RNA sequencing methods. Each protocol has advantages and limitations and which one ends up being the best is going to be dependent on multiple factors. Uh, to end off this introduction, I just wanted to briefly run through some considerations for single cell RNA sequencing. And so in order to select the best protocol, it's good to think about what type of throughput. So are you trying to process hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of cells? What is the sample of origin? What do your dissociation protocols look like? Is your sample frozen or fresh? Um, what type of costs and labor and time limitations are going to be imposed as well as what type of gene body coverage are you looking for? Is it something that is going to be biased to one prime or full length? Um, so for example, if I wanted to classify all cell types in a diverse tissue, you would want to use a more high throughput method if you're looking to discover new things about the transcriptome um, or maybe re-annotate the transcriptome, a full length coverage is going to suit your needs better. Uh, as well as if you only have archival samples, you're going to wanna to make sure to use a method that permits fixed cells or nuclei. And this is just the beginning. If there are any more questions about uh, considerations for a single cell experiment, definitely please put them in the chat, message on Slack, or just reach out in any way that you feel most comfortable. Um, and so I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Looks like, Daniela, there's a question um, uh, in the chat. It says, which of these methods is suitable for a frozen sample? Yeah, so when we're thinking about using frozen samples, uh, it becomes a little bit more of a, a question of what type of cell that you're looking for or you're expecting, um, as well as looking at certain methods, looking at using like the nuclei um, and sorts of things like that. And so it would require, I think, a little bit more understanding um, on what the ultimate outcome of your experiments are going to be. But happy to chat further. Um, feel free to message even on Slack um, or share as much as you're comfortable sharing and then we can find more there. Uh, what is the best technique for detecting rare cells? or underrepresented cells such as human, uh, or these hemopoietic stem cells in infants? Um, that's a great question. I'm not, sh I'm personally not entirely sure of the best method for hemopoietic stem cells. I'm not sure if one, of, if someone else, um, one of our other team leaders, have any experience with that cell type and would know which technique is best. But otherwise, I'm happy to look into it and happy to ask uh, some colleagues that I know who've worked with this. And then I'll definitely send a message. Um, I can, again, put it in the Slack. I unfortunately don't have that off the top of my head, though. So apologies for that. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, Daniela, I think um, for rare cells, like, you know, one of the things you can that people do is just like strength in numbers. And so just the more cells you isolate and profile, the larger your cell subsets that, that are in the data tend to be. So let's say like a cell is only like present half a percent of time, 0.5%. So if you had like a hundred cells that you isolated, you wouldn't, you might not even see that cell, but if you do like a thousand or 10,000, then you start to get enough cells where they even rare cells start to cluster. But the problem with that approach is um, you need to sequence a lot of cells or isolate a lot of cells and that can be expensive. And then I think the other approach people do is, um, you know, if you know um, the rare cell type you're looking for, you can sometimes enrich 
your sorted cells with with markers on the for proteins on the surface of the cells. So for like um, hematopoietic stem cells and all those cells that are differentiating from there, there's like a lot of different surface markers. And actually, that's almost like a best case scenario because in immunology, there's been like decades of finding markers for different cell types and differentiation states. So you're actually in a good situation, I think, for HSCs, because you could probably just enrich using flow cytometry for the populations you care more about. So that's my two cents. But it is a, in general, I think it's a problem because you don't know what you can't see kind of thing. So because you can always sequence more and more and more, but it, it becomes a question of like, do you even know what you're looking for? But it's a good question. Excellent. Thanks, thanks so much. And then uh, could you run the sequencing using long read sequencing devices such as the, is it Minion? I haven't heard of this one um, personally. Uh, a lot of these are not going to give the same uh, type of information as you would get from long read sequencing. And a lot of the methods that I ran through today um, are using different Illumina sequencers. I'm not sure if the Minion is also uh, Illumina based, but traditionally um, they aren't run on long read sequencers. So I don't, I'm not, I wouldn't imagine that the capabilities can be translated. There are other methods that are both single cell and can be used in long read sequencing. Um, not the ones that I talked about today though, but if you wanted to do long read sequencing, be happy to share some of those methods as well. And then the next one is the UMI would be specific for each sample, right? Um, so when we add the UMIs at that point, we have each sample that has been separate or that is still separated from the others. So we will add a mix of UMIs, but each UMI is actually gonna be specific to the individual cell. And there will be multiple UMIs within a sample. And then there will be, diff or there will be um, different barcodes later to separate between samples if you're going to be doing something like multiplexing or uh, just for pooling in general. So the UMIs are going to be specific for each cell in a sample. And so there's one more. Which one would you recommend for determining post transcriptome response to viral infection? Um, again, I so I'm not personally, I haven't looked at that type, um, but I know that some other of our uh, leaders have been working with any of the, with sorry, with that uh, specifically. Um, so I don't know if they have more information, otherwise I can put someone in touch about that. Um, but I don't have any expertise on that one. So I'm, I don't wanna provide any false information. Excellent. So should we move on to Collins and Vincent, or are there any other questions for Daniela? And I think um, Daniela is part of the Slack channel. Um, please, I think, uh, I don't want to speak for you, Daniela, but please reach out to her if you have questions that come, come to you later. Um, she'll be joining us throughout the workshop, so uh, you'll see her uh, in today as well as in the next three days. So uh, thank you, Daniela. Really nice seeing you. Our next speakers are Vincent and Collins from uh, WACVIB and the University of Ghana. Um, and they will be giving a talk introducing us to computational methods and uh, analysis. Um, so Collins and Vincent, over to you. Uh, not able to hear you yet, so I think you're still muted, but we can see. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. There's a bit of rain. I can hear you, yes. 
Okay, great. My name is Collins Moranga from WorkBeep at the University of Ghana. So I'm going to talk to you briefly about the computational analysis methods for single cell data. And just to continue from, uh, from the previous talk, uh, basically uh, it's part of the Human Cell Atlas Africa, uh, which, which was talked about earlier. And we are great to be part of the Human Cell Atlas Initiative globally. So, so in terms of computational methods, basically where it starts is uh, if you think about uh, uh, a stem cell, which gives a parental advice to different cells, and then they differentiate to different cell types, more of they can be anything once they be grow up. So once the sequencing is complete, uh, you come in to analyze data uh, in, is part of trying to entangle what the cells have become in their, in their differentiated stage, as well as what is their particular function. So the, so if you think of uh, different cell types, you can have a cell to cell level variation within a healthy state right here. And then you can have a pre-deceased state cells kind of clustering uh, this side, and then you have uh, at this, this is state A, this is state B. And you can see if you put them on a, on a simple graph, they, all these cells types should be able to differentiate to different states within the graph. And basically that's uh, what the human cell atlas have from my understanding is that they're trying to construct population level maps or human phenotypic variation. And also to illustrate the single cell uh, profile of individual based cells on their phenotypic states. So from the, raw data, from the raw data that is obtained once the sequencing is complete from the different approaches that Daniela has talked about, uh, the first step you do is to do the multiplexing and this is involves you know, separating the, the diff, using the distinct uh, UMI, UMI codes to be able to separate all the different cell types to their individual states. And then uh, the next thing you do is you do mapping. You do mapping of cells and you do this to on the the reference, you know, basically, for example, if you are using uh, a human cells, you are going to use the human uh, reference genome. And, uh, and you are going to get all the different reads mapping to the reference genome in this, in this manner that is shown here. And then most of them will probably map to the uh, intro, to the exons of the different cell types. And then uh, the next thing is you use the distinct UMI to do quantification and finally generate a gene expression. The gene expression matrix normally has, you know, the different cell types, cell one, cell two, all the way to cell N and genes, gene one, gene two to gene M. So depending on the number of cells within an organism, for example, in humans, you are going to have all the different all the different genes as shown there. After here, we proceed on to other steps, which include normalization, imputation, feature selection, differential express genes, and one important thing to note is that uh, this whole process can be containerized into one single pipeline. And some of the pipelines include Cell Ranger. You are going to see them down in my presentation that uh, we have different pipelines. So you just uh, put in your gene single cell data and what you get at the end is the gene expression matrix. So basically my talk, is going to be structured in a way that we talk about sequencing quality, cell quality, expression quality, 
and differential expression of genes. Uh, just to start with sequencing quality, it's always good to, so, so I'm going to talk more about some of the things that you need to consider when you're analyzing uh, or evaluating a single cell data. This, this, can, this can either be a critical thing that you consider or not really very critical depending on your sequencing type. But these are some of the steps that you, you consider when you're analyzing your data downstream from uh, a gene expression matrix. So the first thing is you are going to do to evaluate the mapping statistics. Yeah. And this by you take your read counts, you take the read counts uh, and then you check whether they, how many of them, how many of the number of map reads were unmapped to a particular cell type. And you can, sometimes you can get poor quality cells and these are cells that have a high percentage of unmapped reads or spiking reads. And then sometimes you can have, you know, about from 3 million to 6 million reads. You want to, you want to, ideally what you want to have is reads that are less than 20% uh, of the reads are unmapped. And if you have majority of your reads or majority of the millions of reads being mapped to particular genes, or, but then you have a very good uh, quality cells. And then uh, the other thing that you do is sometimes you have ambient RNA and uh, this is RNA that affects your, your determination of, of the sequencing output. So if you take, for example, on the first plot, uh, we are having a raw data, and then all this is uh, the raw data, and then you have a percentage of, so the plot is showing a mouse gene counts and human gene counts. It's like a correlation, but it's then you have ambient RNA, some swapping and both. So you want to get rid of all this ambient RNA. All you want to remain with is raw data that is uh, accurately, because the human genes and mouse genes are always uh, correlated. So there's a software called a cell vendor, which actually removes all this ambient background and also can also remove uh, backward swapping by uh, deep learning. And most often what you want to look out for are transcripts that are expressed in unexpected cell types. And you remove those genes from all the subsequent analysis. And this could be an example is if you find hemoglobin genes in T cells, then you, you actually realize that, okay, those, those genes, hemoglobin genes cannot be found in T cells. So they are highly misplaced. And that's a characteristic of ambient RNA. So all this should be removed as part of uh, examining the cell quality of your cells. Now, the other thing you do is you need to normalize your data for each cell. And why do we normalize uh, gene expression data? This is because sometimes your cells have been sequenced at different depths, and this could be, and this could be a technical issue Sometimes your cells are different, have a different cell type and in different amounts of mRNA. So you have, let's say you have two different T cells and each of them have different amounts of RNA. And this is a, this is a biological problem. And then uh, typically sometimes you can have an extreme values in distribution of gene expression. And sometimes you can have highly expressed genes that are more variable between different cell types. And if you think about it, uh, if you have, this is total expression before normalization, you can say that all the cells are skewed towards around uh, 2000. So you want to normalize and, and bring the cells that have up to 8000 kind of level of expression back to the 2000 where majority lie. And you, you basically want to have a normal distribution of your data, of your gene expression. And this, you go through, uh, there are so many different methods for doing normalization. And this, this, 
uh, this can be considered I think one of the uh, one of the most common is log normalization and then uh, so just a few recommendations is that you need to perform QC by finding outlier peaks and as well as the fraction of mitochondrial genes the fraction of mitochondrial genes could be could be if it's very high you need to be able to remove most of those cells that have contained mitochondrial genes you also need to be permissive of the downstream so once you've done all the clustering all the steps that i'm going to talk about downstream and you realize this this there's still a problem and it's hindering your interpretation of data what you do is you come back and you recheck you are using threshold. So, if, for example, you had set mitochondrial genes to 30%, you can reduce it to 20. Looks like we might have just lost Collins. Um, why don't we just um, all uh, bear, bear with Collins for a couple of minutes and hope that he's able to rejoin us. So, uh, bear with us, folks, and thanks for your patience. Hello. Hi, Collins. Yeah. Um, yeah, it looks like we lost you. Where did you lose me? Maybe a few. Uh, Long time. And no, maybe 20 seconds ago. Um, and we're not able to see your slides anymore. Okay. Uh, let me share them. Sure. Uh, is this way or the previous slide? Uh, not able to see anything yet, Collins. You're not sharing. Uh, now we can see. Okay, I think, you... uh, uh, I think go to the next slide. I think this is about where uh, you dropped off, but please, fo uh, other folks, let me know if I'm mistaken. Maybe you want to start here? Yeah, I think it was about here. Okay, great. Thanks, Collins. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, apologies for that. Uh, yes, so I was talking about normalization and the need why we do normalization of gene expression data. And I mentioned that sometimes you can have technical issues with your data. And this is whereby you have cells that have been sequenced by at different depths, by different methods and you want to adjust for that. Uh, the second level of, uh, the second reason why you want to do normalization is that you could have cell, cells of different types that have different amounts of mRNA. And this is basically a biological problem, uh, which you cannot avoid. And then uh, sometimes you can have extreme values in distribution of gene expression. And sometimes you can have highly expressed genes that are more variable. And this is var variability between uh, cell types or between individuals. So you want to normalize your data so that you can have a normally distributed uh, data set from this kind of uh, distribution. So I was also giving a few recommendations that is always good to find the outlier peaks in the number of genes, as well as count the depth of the genes and the fraction of mitochondrial genes. Uh, it's also good to, once you've done every step that I'm going to talk about uh, in this presentation, it's always good to come back and check your QC threshold. If, for example, your interpretation of the data is not making sense, you can always come back and change. For example, if your cutoff for mitochondrial genes was 30%, you can reduce it to or in, reduce it to 20% so that you can be able to see a particular uh, uh, if you are not seeing what you expect in your data. Also, uh, it's always good to do, you know, normalized data should be logged. 
are transformed for use with downstream analysis in methods that assume that the data is normally distributed. So if you are going to use uh, uh, a t-test, then you want to use the you want to use data that is uh, normally distributed rather than data that is not normally distributed. Now, I just want to mention a few softwares that you can use for during cell quality. And as I mentioned, some of the pipelines that have been developed to do all the way from uh, se sequencing data to generation, generating uh, gene counts include a cell ranger, drop ESD, STAR is a method for mapping as, uh, your reads to the reference genome. And also you can do, the other thing is uh, you can check for doublets. So doublets is also something that is always a problem. And I think one of the methods that Daniela talked about was using uh, methods that use oil, oil uh, oil-based methods and also as well as plate-based methods. Sometimes you can have double cells in one well and using, you need to check whether you have doublets in your cells. And from this plot, you can see here that if you have a cluster like this and you are seeing a few cells here, this, this could you know, simulate real uh, doublets within your data sets. So it was always good to use some of these softwares to find these doublets. And it's also good to check for your effective size. So for example, if you have three genes, three different cell types, and then you check for their cell depths, you have cell one having six, cell two having 12, cell three having 60. And for example, these are all T cells from the same patients, and then you have a varying level of cell depth within the same patient, then you 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 want to be uh, careful with that. So these are other software that can be used to to to, to do basic analysis of your data set, and you can find more softwares within uh, this link uh, where you have a lot more of them. Uh, so. Once we get an expression matrix, uh, that is you, then you have genes and cells. So that is basically what an expression matrix is. And that is what you get from the initial processing of data using, for example, cell, cell ranger or drop ESD method, you get cells and genes in this kind of matrix. And the next thing you do is feature selection. So you kind of, uh, do the pre-processing and the quality steps, which we've talked about previously, so that you can narrow down to genes that are actually are highly variable. And then uh, the next thing we are going to talk about briefly is dimensionality reduction. And then we'll also talk a little bit about clustering and some of the methods that are recommended for doing a clustering of, of your cells. So, Basically, high dimensional data can be very difficult to interpret. And uh, one of the approach is to just simplify or assume that some of the, your data of interest lies within a low dimensional space. And if the data of interest is, is of low dimension, then the data can be visualized in a low dimensional space. So that means if your data is high dimensional, you want to reduce it to a low dimensional space. And some of the common methods that we use for doing uh, a dimensionality reduction uh, listed here. That is the principal component analysis, independent component analysis, and all the rest. So basically, if you think about it, we have a, a gene, an expression matrix, whereby you have 10,000 genes and 1,000 cells. And this is, this is quite huge if you are trying to understand what is the variation between, for example, the different cell types. So what you want to do is just reduce it to very few components. So if you have about one or two components that explain majority of the variation within your different cell types, then you are good to go. So because then you can be able to interpret that uh, uh, the differences in expression as a result of a particular biological question. So, and then uh, the other thing is that if you are using a large number of features, 
the clusters become less distinct. And as a result, you end up with shorter distances between different cell types, and you will not be able to uh, see the actual differences. Take, for example, uh, this plot. If you have different six different cell types, if you have only 500 genes that you are studying between the different cell types, then you can see that, for example, the blastocysts here, they are well distinct within this graph. Uh, you have these two cells being very distinct. You have these groups being distinct. But if you end up having using 20,000 genes, then you sometimes you end up with an overlap of, of some, 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 some genes within two different clusters. And you cannot be able to tell distinctly uh, which cells belong to a particular cell type. So you also want to reduce the number of features. That's why you do a kind of feature selection. And you want to, I mean, it's recommended to select about 1,000 to 5,000 highly variable genes so that you can, you can reduce this uh, kind of uh, clustering or reducing the distances between your clusters. And this sometimes also depends on your data complexity and the amount of cells you get from uh, your sequencing method. So the other thing I want to mention is the clustering. So normally uh, data can become very sparse in a high dimensional space. And if you use uh, the old methods of k-mean or hierarchical clustering, you're going to end up with very, because they measure data, they measure, uh, they identify clusters based on uh, groups of points, uh, based on different individual points within a, a, two, a dimensional space. You want to use a method that uh, identifies, you know, groups of points in within a, a two dimensional space, because what happens is that if you have uh, 1,000 cells uh, that you're evaluating and you have several T cells, so all these cells are highly uh, are highly similar. So Euclidean distance or then the old uh, method for identifying clusters are going to, you know, kind of, it's going to be very difficult for them to identify the, the different clusters uh, between these cell types. So you want to use uh, newer methods of community detection. And these are methods that just look out for groups of cells that have, have uh, shorter distances between them. And these are methods that are called graph-based clustering. And one of the, one of the examples is, is Lovian method. Uh, I think it is one of the methods that has been integrated within the Surat objects. A SURAT uh, package that I think we are going to use in this uh, workshop to study the, uh, the single cell data. So, and basically there's no point of performing rectangle clustering of a thousand cells if 90% of the pairwise distances are null, or there's no particular, there's no much difference between them. So that's why most people uh, have adopted the community uh, detection or graph-based clustering that is more robust to identify the cell clusters. So I would like to briefly talk about batch effects and, and why you need to correct for batch effects. So take, take for example, you have uh, all these biological groups. So you have group one, group two, group three, and then if you process them, you decide to process group one, alone so that as batch one you process group two, group two separately as batch two and you process group three separately as batch three what is going to happen is that you are not going to be able to determine if the variation that you're going to see is based on the biology or or because you process the samples or the batches differently so what you get you might see something like this group one that is uh, biological group one, biological group two and three beings are distinctly separate. And if you do a principal component analysis, then you see them as separating, uh, having three unique clusters and each cluster is representing a group of, a group of, you know, the biological group. So this is 
this is not very good. And this is why it's recommended that you adopt the second method whereby you have a balanced study design. You collect, you have biological group one, you collect replicate one and replicate two. And then biological group two, you collect two separate replicates. And what you do is that you mix all of them or you at least when you are processing the samples, you, you, you select them uh, using randomly without really uh, being sensitive to which batch they come from, or you try and have an equal sample from each group so that you, they are all processed at the same time. And then you are not going to have a uh, batch effects. And at the end of the day, you are going to see you know, plots that look like this that imply that variation is driven, driven by biology because you are going to have each of the cluster in the principal component plot mm -hmm. is going to have a mixture of different cell types from the different groups. And this is, this is, uh, this is what you expect. And a typical ex example is, for example, you have experiments one, two, and three, and you've already identified the cell types. So when you look at this plot, Keenly, you see T cells here, you see T cells here, you see monocytes, you'll see monocytes here. They're all mixed up and you have another T cells here. So this shows you that you've, you've, you have batch effects. And I think there are algorithms or computational methods that are able to do batch correction. And you can do this so that at the end of the day, you have T cells separating independently, B cells separating and monocytes macrophages and related cells like dendritic cells being on their on a cluster of their own so but it's always advisable to correct this during a study design level and and sample processing rather than trying to correct it after a computation analysis but basically this is one of the things you do for during evaluating expression quality you want to see that you know, your different clusters are not driven by the different cell types at the different biological groups, but rather by the different cell types that are present within your data. So the other thing that we do is you do mark identification. So basically once you do your PCA, principal component analysis, you want to use uh, a UMAP uniform manifold approximation method for, for visualization, and then not present your data in terms of a PCA plot for, because it's normally used for general purpose summation of data. And then you want to do mark identification. So this is where you do clustering and use something like a heat map to be able to see which genes, which genes are, a clustering in this group or in the different groups, are they genes that can identify a particular cell type? So one, one thing you want to see is, for example, if you are studying a PBMCs and you have T cells, B cells, and, uh, and other different cell types, you want to see that all the genes that are forming this cluster, for example, could be genes that are associated with B cells. And the genes that are forming this cluster are genes that are associated with uh, T cells and genes that are forming in other cluster are genes that are associated with monocytes. And from this, you can be uh, sure that there's, you've identified markers that are, you know, predictive of the different cell types that are present within your data. And you can go on and do other things like trajectory analysis, which is basically a diffusion map that is showing you a differentiated state of cells or how cells in a developmental stage. If for example, you are using cells that are normally under development. And then uh, other things you can do is like spatial tissue reconstruction so that you actually see whether the different cell types separate uh, in different you know, clusters. And then, so, Again, I would like to point out a few softwares that you can consider or tools. Uh, Surat is one of the methods that we use for all these downstream method, all these downstream analysis. But you have other methods or tools like ScanP, uh, C, SC6, uh, and then uh, you have 
to capture things like trajectories, you can use uh, Monaco and all these different uh, uh, software that you can be able to use. As again, you can find most of these tools in this uh, website. Now, the other thing that you have to deal with uh, in evaluating the expression qualities is cell type annotation and finding new cell types or allocating cells along a differentiated cascade is always one of the biggest challenges that a lot of people have tried to develop tools to automate this process. And we are going to see some of those in a bit. So you, if you have a mixed population of cells and you do clustering and you end up with two different cell clusters, I think one of the things is one, what I've mentioned, you look at the different markers you're using, for example, a heat map to see which genes are being expressed in this cluster, which genes are being expressed in this cluster, and then, or you can sort them along a developmental trajectory to see which genes are being expressed here and here, and link them basically to back to biology and what is already known with different genes that are involved in different processes. And once you do this, you characterize them to different populations. And then you can be able to do things like differential gene expression analysis or differential transcript usage and other things like uh, network analysis. So one thing that uh, is advisable is that when you are doing statistical tests on trying to compare the different amount of cell types, for example, you have uh, T cells in one patient and T cells in another patient, you want to use you know, proportion-based uh, methods that are able to quantify the differences based on proportions, not the amount, the number of cell types that you're getting. So as I said, there are two methods for doing, okay, maybe three methods for doing uh, cell type annotation. One of them is a manual method, whereby once you generate uh, your two-dimensional plot or TSNI plot or UMAP, you want to look at which, which genes are being expressed in this cluster. So you can do this with a heat map, as I mentioned before, or you can use a UMAP plots like this or TSNI plots to color based on specific markers that you know. For example, MS, MS4A1 is, I think could be for B cells. Once you color it, you only see where the, the coloring is and not in all the other cell types. And this categorically tells you that this particular cluster is for, for B cells. And then uh, yes, so I wanted to say that, you know, in terms of automation, there are so many tools that have been developed or softwares, and they are listed here. And each of them, most of them are based in Python and R and they use different machine learning classifiers to be able to, to, to do their prediction. Some of them use prior knowledge. For example, we, we, if we know that you know uh, a particular CD14 is for monocytes. So you want to write your program and tell it that anytime they see CD14 is for monocytes or macrophages kind of cells. Others do not use prior knowledge. They just use how cells are clustered and they, they do the prediction of, of, the, of the cell type. Uh, one, of the, one of the other, or the third method that is recommended is using a reference-based annotation. And this is whereby you take your query data set and you map it to a reference single cell RNA-seq data set, and then you end up annotating the different clusters of your cell types. And this is, this is a method that has been implemented in uh, CIRAT, I think version four, whereby you can be able to identify cells uh, based on a reference data set that has already been sequenced. And this is, this is actually an advantage because most of the cells have, some of the cells have been sequenced already and have already been provided as reference maps that we can all borrow from and use them to, to do reference-based annotation of our cell type. So once you do sequencing of your data, all you have to do is, for example, if you are looking at the, the brain tissue 
and somebody already has a reference data set of brain tissue, you want to use that to do prediction of, uh, of, your, of, your, of your cells. And once you do this, uh, it's always important to do manual annotation whereby you color, you, you do the same thing that we were doing. You know a specific gene is associated with a particular cell type. For example, CD14. So you still want to, once you do a reference-based annotation, you still want to do a manual annotation and confirm that the prediction of uh, your reference-guided annotation are correct. And at the end of the day, you can have fully annotated uh, data sets, but you can do other things like use experiments to confirm, uh, do uh, statistical analysis. You can also talk to experts who also work in that area so that they can uh, tell you whether you are, you've done correct reference-based uh, annotation. So I would, I think uh, Daniela talked a little bit about this. So the different cell types or cell identity can be affected by so many things. And these include the environmental stimuli. So this could be something like epigenetic uh, stimulation you have cell development, so you are, you've just sampled your cells at a particular point in time, and you are using it to, you know, make a case. So you want to be careful that you are not using the observations you are making are not generalized because your cells could be under developmental process. Uh, the other thing that is important to consider is the cell cycle or the spatial context that is the actual location of the cells, because if you do like uh, macrophages, some are found in circulation, while some are found between uh, tissues. So you, 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 the spatial context of the different cells is very important. And these are some of the things that you should consider uh, when you are doing data analysis, the spatial position of, of your cells, the cell cycle, the the unidirectional, you know, uh, trajectories of cells. And this is, which is very good to always do for your different cell types, because sometimes you could be uh, identifying a T cell that is supposed to be, you know, a precursor or hematopoietic stem cell. And some other continuous phenotypes, for example, regulatory and pro-inflammatory genes. Uh, in different cell types. So you could find that dendritic cells are expressing a particular gene. After a few hours, it shuts down and monocytes continue. So or other dendritic cells are expressing that gene while others have already finished expressing that particular gene. So some of the phenotypes are continuous and these are some of the things that you need to pay attention to. Uh, one of the one of the things is that you should always use measured data for statistical testing. Uh, also, you know, do not use marker, marker gene p-values to validate cell identity clusters. So it's always no good to, you know, use p-values or try to, to use to, to determine that, you know, the cell identity that you've identified is, is as correct as it can get. It's always, it's always a prediction based on particular gene types. And other things that you need to consider when you are doing cell identity annotation is that all these things that we've talked about, uh, batch effects, the quality of the sequencing, uh, cell-specific capture efficiency, amplification bias, other things like allele intrinsic variation, or uh, varying rates of RNA processing, these are all things that you need to pay attention to. And some of the things that I've just talked about, including uh, temporal progression of cells. So you should put all these into consideration. And when you're doing analysis, at least for gene expression analysis, these are some of the things that you can include in your analysis. And we are going to see briefly how you do that, how you include them, because you can regress out all these technical and biological covariates in a joint method. And sometimes it's not good to do them serially by doing one by one. And I think we'll, I will highlight on that briefly. Also, other, another thing is that if you are doing data integration, batch correction, some of these methods, you should be able to do them 
uh, they should be performed using different different methods so that you can be sure that what you are doing is actually accurate. And because sometimes data integration methods can overcorrect some simple batch effects that are actually that could be actually actual biological variation. And for each gene, some of the observed expression profile that is generated from a single cell RNA seq could be caused by a combination of factors. And this is this is the same thing that we are talking about. You take you take a particular gene, is is still undergoing differentiation, is still under is still on a different cell cycle state. Uh, it has some genes that are being expressed on apoptosis. And all these three uh, different things could uh, affect your observed expression profile. So I'm just highlighting three, but you could have more different states that are acting in combination to affect your observed expression profile. And these are some of the things that you know you need to really take into consideration because they can prevent your signal of interest or the differentiated state of your cell to be uncovered. And if you don't take them into consideration, you, are, you might not see the actual signal that you, you expected for, let's say, a particular disease state. And finally, uh, just to highlight on differential expression. So in single cell analysis, we often do not have a defined set of experimental conditions. So one of the things you can do is pairwise comparison of uh, gene expression between pairs of clusters or pairs of cell types. And you know most people use the Wilcoxon's methods, others can use t-test, poison, and so many other methods to do the testing. Uh, the Wilcoxon is always most used uh, because data could not be exactly 100% normally distributed when you're doing powers analysis. And at this stage, it's also good to correct for confounders, just as we've talked about. And this can be done using regression analysis. And you do this to remove all the confounding factors. So for example, you have, uh, I think I've already mentioned different technical variation, biological variation, and so many other confounding factors, you should be able to correct them. And, and one of the recommended methods is called a uh, zero inflated model. And this is whereby there's no noise, the zero noise of data is not there within your data set. So if you take, for example, this equation, you have uh, M number of samples and particular number of genes, and you are doing a regression based on different biological factors. These are known factors, are known factors. You could annotate them in one way or the other. And some are known parameters. So if you're including biological factors in, in your model, you also have to do a constant for all the unknown parameters. And you, you add observed technical covariates uh, and the unknown parameters, you also had add hidden technical covariates with unknown parameters and you know basically uh, other constants that you can be able to add in your data set. And, and you do this uh, so that you can be able to have a clear signal from your data on the exact thing that is happening because then you've collect, corrected for biological factors, technical factors, and other things that you might not know, as well as the zero mean noise of your data set. Because even if you do, uh, even if you use zero inflated data, you are not exactly going to have a good, you still have some data set that is still on zero. So it's always good to add the zero mean noise to your regression model to be able to, to see uh, the predictions. So a few thoughts on differential expression. Uh, it should be performed, should not be performed on corrected data. So most often uh, when, you are, when you are doing differential expression, you have to state that you are, you are, you are using the actual RNA data set. And because then 
you will not be able to see all the technical covariates that are, should be included in the model because you would have removed them. Or you could not see all the biological effects that you need to account for in your regression model. Also, uh, it's recommended to use masks uh, for your data analysis. And sometimes be wary of the uncertainty that can be inferred from regulatory relationships of your different genes. Because if you, I, I talk about you know immunology because I do uh, single cell on immunological data. So if, for example, you are looking at a gene that regulates another gene, for example, the nf kappa B pathway is regulated by a particular gene like TNF-alpha. So if you are looking at, at the differential expression, so you have to be careful in terms of your interpretation because one gene could be regulating another. So if this gene is not being expressed or it's not highly expressed, you need to ask yourself, why is this pathway or these genes in this particular pathway highly expressed, yet they are only activated by a particular gene that is slowly expressed. And modules of genes that are enriched in regulatory uh, relationships can be more reliable than individual ages. So in summary, uh, or finally, I want to say that, you know, we encourage everyone from Africa to move into single cell analysis. It's, it's or generating single cell data and we'll be able to contribute this or new data into developing you know, the eventual atlas by using the existing cell atlases that have been generated so that we can all develop a, a cell, cell type ontology. And just to add to what uh, Musa said that you know, at the end of the day, we want to see contribution of, of uh, the Africa gene expression profile based on their diseases of interest so that you can add to the human cell atlas. So with that, I would like to say thank you and I can take questions. Thank you, Collins. Um, does anyone have questions? Feel free to raise your hand or write them in the chat. I don't see any questions coming through. Um, so what do we think? Should we uh, go ahead and take a break now? Um, I think we should plan to to reconvene. Oh, oh, sorry, Collins. Yeah, I was asking how many minutes are left. Uh, let's see. So we ended a, a little early. Um, let me see here. One second. So we we're going so to she'll be fine. break. So we could we could reconvene um, in fifteen. I guess at ten thirty Eastern time, which I believe. Uh, I wanted to highlight on the available, you know, computational architecture that, you know, African scientists can leverage from work with. If there is still more time. There is, and you're getting some questions in now. So if you want to address those, um, they came through the chat, Collins. I can read them out for you, or if you want to look at them yourself. Yeah. yeah, I think I think Or has been answering some of the questions, so he can he can also assist uh, in a more discursive way. Yeah. Or do you want to do you want to so manage it? Great idea. Uh, sure, I can help. Uh, let me see. So, thanks for the lecture. Is there a free source tool for generating expression matrix from a raw reads from Danielle? Um, so Danielle, um, we're actually going to talk about that um, tomorrow. Uh, about tools to go from your raw sequencing data to the expression matrix. Um, I don't know. If they if there's anything that's like actually free free, 
Um, Daniel uh, tomorrow will present a method in the cloud. Uh, and you do get, as a new user, you get $100 free credits. Um, I think about $100. And so the cost of a seek of a run is typically like a few cents, I think, to generate the expression matrix. So it would be free for a while. Um, but I don't know if anything is like always available that you could run. Um, but we can talk more about that tomorrow, or we can try to find more resources on that. Um, I don't know, Collins, is there anything you know about tools that let you generate expression matrices for free from sequencing data? No, uh, the, <clears throat> I think you are right. Some of the tools like on the Terra, on the Terra cloud, I think, I think you have to pay some, some cents. Yeah. Um, because there are developed pipelines like Serenja, you have to drop EST. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Daniel, the other thought I just had as we're thinking of this is there's also um, methods in the programming language Python that are based on very, very fast aligners that are like it's called pseudo aligners. And those actually require very little memory and run very quickly. They give you slightly different things, but they can be run on your local computer very easily and they're fast. So that's also another option. It's called Callisto tools. Um, or KB tools, uh, that's another option, but you can ping us in the Slack if uh, if uh, if you want more information. Daniel, did you have any thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that it's you're not actually charged for running those tools. It's like you're paying for the compute resource. So if you have access to a, a compute cluster where you can run um, intensive jobs, then you do it is for free, but running it on a cloud requires money. Right. Good, good points, Daniel. Um, and then, uh, Collins, do you want to take the next question about regression and how to know what regression method to consider? Yeah. So, <clears throat> So I think a regression is is just uh, the normal regression method. All you have to do is you know try to add all the other uh, things as maybe in into the model. You can add them as things that are interacting or you know any any approach that you want to take. There's no specific way of actually doing it when you're doing uh, the regression. It's all up to what, are, what is your what is your biological question or what you are asking, and what could be the biological, you know, challenges that you cannot account for? So you you want to include them into the model, and then if you know that you did not process the data properly, you had some level of technical variation, you process some batches uh, in a in a in cold temperatures while others in warm temperatures. So these are some of the things you can just include into your model, uh, but there's no specific method to consider. And um, then, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, we can both take this. Um, so VC asked about batch correction and does log normalization take care of the batch correction or do you do these separately? So, um, so VC, uh, you know, the log normalization corrects for the differences in sequencing depth across your different cells. So let's say you had one batch where the, the sample got 2 million reads and then the other batch, the sample got 1 million reads. The problem there is now everything looks more highly expressed in one sample relative to the other, just because you detect more because you sequence more. So the, 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 the normalization by sequencing depth does remove some form of a batch effect, but it's kind of a very simple type of batch effect. And then these more um, thought out correction methods that uh, Collins was talking about and that we posted a, a review article uh, in the Slack and in the Zoom chat, um, that's a good discussion of the other methods. But typically the log normalization alone won't just remove like all your batch effect. Um, 
yeah, Collins might have his thoughts too. Oh, I think I think I think that's some some. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, batch corrections really difficult topic. Um, we're not gonna. We don't have like um, a lab on it, but um, I think once we've gotten through these three days of material, you'll be kind of suited to read these papers and run those methods. Um, it's not any more complicated. I think what's complicated is knowing that it worked in a way that you want it to work and hasn't, as Colin said, removed biological signal or done something unexpected. Like it's not hard to run them. It's more hard to interpret the outputs, I would say. <laughs> Excellent. Any more questions? Okay, so what I think we should do is um, rejoin at the time on the on the schedule, which is in 30 minutes from now. So set your timers for 30 minutes. Um, you get an extra 15 minutes for break. So that's great. So go please stretch your legs. Uh, grab a cup of coffee or tea, um, and we will rejoin here in this room at 2.45 GMT, uh, which is 10.45 Eastern time. So we'll see you soon. Enjoy your break. Yes. Yes. Great, okay. I can hear you. And um, just wanna let everyone know that we're re-recording. Um, and uh, Vincent, on to you, please. Yes, okay. Yeah, so for this course, we are going to use an R server. Ordinarily, we could have given you the packages to install and order, but that's also a lot of work. So we decided to just uh, streamline things. So we have already installed all the packages and stuff that we'll use. So I'll just do a quick demo to show you how to access the R server. So you have to open your browser. Let me share my screen first. Let me, um, okay, so can you see my screen now? I think that I looks think, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. So you, you only see the Firefox, the Firefox um, logo. So you need to get the link to log in. So there's the link. Let me also put it in the chat box um, for you to in case some of you have not received it. So I'll put the link here. Yes. And so you also need to make sure you have your username and then the password, which has been sent to you via email. And once you have that, you'll be able to um, log in using your browser. So I'll assess the web server now using the link that I gave. So you will see this. And so you just have to use your username and this is my username and then your password. And then once you are done, then it will log you in. Yeah, so if you log in, there's the R interface, which um, the other instructors will take you through. So um, here you can write your R script, import your, your code and all that. But we have also made the script available um, on your account. So if you want to load the script, just go to file and then go to open file. And then in your home directory, you will find some materials there. And so the instructors will tell you which files to load. So all of them are here and then they will show you. So basically that's how we load the R scripts. And then for data, we have also made them available. And then there may be a little modification in the codes. The instructors will let you know how to load all the data. We've done some pre-processing for you as well. So that's basically about it, about using the server. But if there are any issues, just let us know and we are going to um, resolve them for you as the course goes on. So. And that's about it. So I will let um, the others take over from here.
Okay, I see some, qu let me check. Oh, okay, okay, it's just about the login. Um, okay, so the usernames and password will be sent to you. Yeah, will be sent to you by mail or by Slack. So just um, check. And I already see some people have logged in, so that um, is good. And so, Christine, will you send them the um, the details? Yes, you should have actually already received those details. But um, for those who need help, please uh, just let Elliot and I know, and we'll respond to you in in the chat. So um, I see there's a few people that need it again, but please do check your email and um, emails. I can share with you the header of that email. Yeah, you just and can then also check your spam folder sometimes the email may go to the spam. So check the spam folder to see if you have received an email. Okay, so uh, maybe give me a moment so I can get folks on. Elliot, maybe we can divide and conquer. Sounds good. Okay, yeah, so I see people logging in. I think now I see two um, two users who have logged in now. So the others should try and then also log in. Okay, yeah, I see a lot of them, uh, a lot of users logging in now, so, yeah. Okay, is there still anyone else um, that needs their username or password? I think Elliot and I tried to get through everyone, but we might have missed a, skipped over someone by accident. If there's anyone else that still needs their username and password to log on, please let us know and we will get that to you. Anyone else? Okay, and for those who just joined, um, we are logging into our studio. 
Uh, Vincent, do you want to just recap on how to do that? I think there were two people that just joined. Okay, so let me go over again. Okay, thank you so much. So first of all, you need to get the link which has been sent. Let me um, send again to the Zoom chats. So you need to use your browser and access this link. That's the first step. So once you access the link, you get this. you will get this um, login page. So you log in with your username and then password, and then you just go to sign in. Great. That's what you have to do. Okay, great. Yeah. And just um, if anyone still needs their, uh, their username and password, let us know. Um, is everyone logged in? If not, please do that. I think that's an instrumental next step <laughs> to move forward in the process, right, Vincent? Yes. So okay. I think, yeah, I think now everyone has logged in. Yeah. I mean, okay. I think there's checking one or two more. Uh, logs. Okay, great. Vincent, I'll turn it over to you, but I'll just say one more time that if you do need your username or password, let me or Elliot know and we will get that to you. Okay, over to you, Vincent. Okay, yeah, so let's, um, I think, let's see. Okay, yeah, so um, yes. So basically now we are only doing the preparation. So I am showing you how to log into the R server, which I see a lot of people already logged in. Um, yes, I mean, okay.
So Vincent, um, uh, I don't hear you speaking, but I hear you scrolling and- uh... Oh yes, I'm just um, checking okay. the messages. Now oh, I'm, just, I'm just waiting for everyone to log in. Those who have challenges, I'm just reading the messages and then resolving them. Oh, great, okay. All righty. So Jones, um, I think you just joined us. You'll need to log on to the R Studio server. Um, let me copy that link. Yes, yes, so yeah, and thanks. Oop, sorry, that did not come through correctly. One moment, please. So Jones and anyone else who just joined, please click the sign in link that I just um, sent. And please sign in using your username and password that was sent to you. If you need it again, please let me know and either Elliot or I will send that username and password to you. <clears throat> Um, please take note that um, depending on your internet speed, the browser may take some time to load. So um, just take note of that and make sure you have a good internet connection because everything has been done on the web. So uh, Diana, I believe that you just uh, entered. So Diana, you'll need to log on to the uh, the R server using the link that I just added in the chat. And if you need your username and password, please either let Elliot Boblet or me know, and we will get that to you again. Um, but please do log in to the server.
Mm, okay, good. I think now everyone is logged in now. So I think we can proceed. I think everyone now has a user account. Okay, yeah. So I assume um, everyone is logged. I see a lot of um, user accounts here logged in successfully. And also we will keep this account active. So after we are done with the course, let's say today, for example, the account is active. So you can also practice during the evening or whatever time that is convenient for you. So take note of that. So you'll keep it active for some time and then, yeah. So maybe if you have challenges now, maybe when the, you have a good internet connection, you can still log in. The materials are on the server. So you can still log in and then try to rerun all the codes later on. So um, just take note of that. Okay, I think now so far, um, we don't have any more requests for user accounts and stuff. So I believe everyone has successfully logged in. Okay. Yeah, it's it's okay. Yeah, okay. So I think uh, Sarah can take off from here because now um, so far things are looking okay um, to me. And there are no more requests coming. So I assume that everyone is successfully logged in. So we can proceed. Okay, great. And before just moving over to, um, to Sarah, Vincent, if people have an issue, should they um, direct their question to you, Vincent, on, on Slack? Or what's the best way to uh, resolve an issue on our Slack? Yeah, have. we can do it by Slack or by Zoom, whichever one. I'm still um, on standby. So if there are any issues, okay. Yeah, we'll yeah. Great. So if you have any issues from this point forward, logging on to our studio, please contact Vincent either here in the Zoom chat or you can use the Slack channel that we've set up. Okay. Sarah, on to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vincent. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay, can you guys see my screen now? Yes, looks great. Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah uh, uh, I from, I am a research associate from the Shalek Lab. Um, I am also from Burundi uh, in East Africa, and I am so excited to be part of this workshop. So today we're going to talk about the introduction to R, uh, because it's useful and uh, important to get some notions and basic concepts, just to kind of get an idea on how R works before actually using it. Um, Okay, so first, what is R? So R was created in, in the 1990s by statisticians Ross Ihaka and uh, Robert Gentleman. Uh, it is defined as both a language and a software which are used for statistical analysis and graphics. It is also considered as a dialect of the S language. Um, so just to give a little bit more concepts, that means that uh, it was built on the same basis and execute the same function as the S uh, language. So the S language was developed around 1976 uh, at Bell Laboratories. And uh, 
one of the one of the key limitation of the S language was that it was only available in a commercial package, which is S plus. So when R was uh, developed by these statisticians, so Ross and Robert were convinced to use the GNU, which is the general public uh, license to make R a free software. So that was kind of like a game changer because the entire R system was uh, suddenly became like available to anyone who wanted to use it or play with it. So you can obtain R in several forms, uh, depending on the type of machine that you have. Uh, you can either obtain it from the sources if you use Unix and Linux machines, or from some pre or like from some pre-compiled binaries if you use Windows, Linux, and Macintosh, which will go through it later. So next, uh, why R? So why R, like why does it matter? Uh, R is a free and open soft source. Uh, like I said, it's a free software, anyone can use it. It is also one of the most widely used software environments in data science. It has an effective data handling and st storage facility. And one of the key features for R is that it has many functions uh, that provide a large variety of statistical analysis and graphical facilities for data analysis. Uh, these functions can also be displayed uh, immediately like on the screen in their own window, or you can also save them on hard and have a hard copy, uh, and you can save them in various formats, uh, such as PDF, JPG, PNG, etc. Another key feature for R is that uh, you can actually manipulate those functions. So it is possible to combine uh, different statistical functions in a single program, and that could allow us to uh, perform more complex analysis. Okay. So next, how to install R. So there are three basic steps on how to install R. So first, you need to install R first, and then you need to install R Studio. And then next, you'll be installing R packages. You may wonder what is the difference between R and R Studio. So R is a program that runs all your code. And then R Studio is another program that's going to allow you to control R, but in a more friendly way. So it comes with these cool features, like it has a text editor where you're going to like run, uh, you're going to write all your code. It also has a place called R Console where you're going to um, actually run the code that you that you wrote in the text editor, which we'll see later as well. So first, let's talk about installing R. So to install R, we use the CRAN website, which stands for Comprehensive R Archive Network. And when you go to this website, so this website basically like stores all the files that you need to install R. And when you go to this website, you're gonna see like a page that looks like this. And then to install R, like I said before, like it depends with the type of machine that you have, and you will want to click to each one of them depending on the machine that you have. So we're gonna see some couple of examples just for the sake of time. So to, to install R using uh, Mac OS, you can either uh, click on the following website or like feel free to also scan this QR code right here. Uh, so when you when you scan it, you're going to see a page that looks like this, and uh, it basically shows the latest version of the PKG file that are available as of now, I believe. Uh, so you're, you will want to click on uh, whichever, depending on the, tap, the type of Mac that you have. So if you have like Intel Mac, you'll click on this file, or like if you have M1 Mac, you'll click on this file right here. And then once you click on it, um, R shall be able to download itself and then be installed on the computer. Okay, so next, let, let's see how to install R for Windows. So to install R for Windows, you will use this website right here, or like you can also scan this um, QR code right here, and then it will take you to this page. And what you need to do is to click on this uh, link right here, and this shall be able to, to, to open the R installer. So you will also need to double click on the R installer 
in order for it to, to, to like to proceed forward. And then when you double click the R installer, it's going to launch itself. And then you'll see a tab that looks like this. It's going to uh, ask you to select your choice of language. And then once you're done, you click OK. Um, <clears throat> it's going to want you to read the important information about the license. Once you're done, you click Next. And then you will need to define the path of where you want R to be installed on your computer. So just uh, tell it like which destination location that you want it, that you want to put in. And then next, you're you're gonna click next, and then it's gonna want you to choose uh, um, components that shall be installed. So ideally, we would want to keep all the components um, uh, checked in. And then you're going to click next again. And then you will see the, the startup option that you can customize. But ideally, you will click no and accept defaults. And then you're going to click next again. Um, and then you're like, uh, you're going to you're gonna be prompted to this tab right here that uh, shows you that you can select start menu folder. And by default, you're not going to have access to here until you unclick this check here. So you shall unclick it and you'll have the option to select the start menu folder. And then after that, you will move to next. So when you move to next, uh, you will uh, be asked some additional tasks. You can either create a desktop shortcut or like you can create a quick launch shortcut. So whichever your choice is, uh, you're going to click next after. And then this will prompt you to the installation of R on your computer for people who use Windows. And uh, you'll finally be done. And R will be good to go. OK, so now let's talk about installing R Studio. So to install RStudio, you can open the following website or scan this QR code right here. This will bring you to a page that looks like this, and you can either select RStudio desktop or RStudio server. So these are um, contained like integrated tools for R, both of them. The only difference is that one of them has access to the browser, so the RStudio server, and the other one doesn't. So feel free to download whichever is most is most convenient for you. Okay, so when um, so finally, when you click on the download button, you're gonna be um, you're gonna see this page after, and uh, you basically want to choose whichever depending uh, whichever whichever like uh, website here depending on uh, the type of uh, machine that you have. So for Mac, it's pretty straightforward. You will just have to click uh, the download. R Studio for Mac, and then it will automatically be installed on your computer. So let's just see an example on how to install R Studio on Windows. So you're gonna see. So once you click, um, once you click on this tab right here, you're gonna see like something that looks like this, and then uh, it will guide you through the installation of R Studio. So you may want to click next, and then you will choose the path. Uh, like the location where you want your R Studio to be installed at, you're gonna click next again, and uh, you will have the option to like uh, maybe create a new folder. You can just type in and uh, type in R Studio since that's what you're installing, and then you'll be clicking next install, and uh, this will guide you to the installation of R Studio on uh, for people who use Windows, and R Studio will be good to go. Okay, so next, let's see how to install packages in R. But first, let's talk about what are packages. What do we mean by packages? So like I said, R is a free software and packages can be uh, viewed as like a form of bundle or collection of functions and they can also be created by anyone. So here is a list of uh, packages that are most commonly used, uh, especially for uh, people who, who like who just begin to use R. Like these are the packages that I was familiar with when I started uh, using R. So I thought about going through each other just to kind of get an idea of, oh, okay, what does this package do? So 
Here we have uh, ggplot2. So ggplot2 is pretty popular for data visualization. So it gives you the option to uh, graph most kinds of data like in a very simple way. We also have patchwork. Patchwork right here makes plot composition in R extremely simple and powerful. Um, for people who use ggplot a lot, um, patchwork is really good because it makes sure that um, the, the plots are properly aligned no matter the complexity in your composition. And then right here, we have Deep Layer. Deep Layer is well known for uh, data manipulation. It makes uh, tabular data manipulation fast and easier. And then we have Tidier. So Tidier makes it easier to tidy your data. So to tidy means uh, to organize. And um, so the way that I think about this uh, package right here is that uh, like I know it has three functions like separate, gather, and spread. And uh, spread. So like let's say like you have some characters that are like clumped together like in a single column, and you want to tease them apart. So tidier will use like um, the the separate the separate function that it has in order to do that. And then here we have the string R. So string R provides a set of functions that are useful for data cleaning. Uh, strings can be viewed as like a bunch of character variables. So like, let's say you want to extract um, a, a special, like uh, a specific uh, like uh, character. You want to extract it, string R will be good for it. Or like you want to remove a case of like, in your word, string R will be like a really good one to use for that. Okay, so next we have Surat. So Surat is designed for quality control analysis and exploration of single cell RNA sequencing data. You will use this a lot if you do some uh, a lot of analysis uh, related with single cell. Um, it allows, I know it allows like the users to identify and like uh, interpret some um, heterogeneity of, um, of single cell um, transcriptomic measurements. And then we, next we have matrix. So matrix collects data sets and arrange them in two dimensional rectangular organizations. Okay, so there are a few ways of installing packages in R. Um, this right here is the main repository for uh, software packages in R. It's called uh, the Comprehensive R Archive Network, and it holds over 18,000 packages. And then next, we have the Bioconductor. The Bioconductor is an open uh, software development for computational biologists and bioinformaticians, and it holds over 1,800 packages. Next, you can install packages in R using GitHub. So the, the packages can be directly downloaded from the, the GitHub online software, but you will need to use the dev tools packages. I will, I'm happy to send like any instructions on how to do that um, later. But you can also install packages in R using uh, from sources. So all you need to do is download the source package, uh, open terminal app, uh, navigate to the directory where you want, you currently have the file, and then you would execute like usually like you put the package name and then you do dot tar dot gz. Like so in your command, it will look like something like this. Okay. So now let's get started with our studio. So our studio has different compartments. Um, it has uh, a text editor, like I said, this is where you're gonna write all your codes, the codes that you're gonna run. And uh, it has an R console. So the R console basically uh, give uh, the commands, like give, um, like it is waiting you to tell it, like, what should I do? Like, so this is where like all your commands will be run. And then uh, we have the environments and the history type tab. Uh, so the environments basically displays like all the variables uh, that are generated during the course of programming. And then it's gonna show you like all the, where are the, all the values that you've generated so far, what type of data that you have, like it's gonna give you all the information. And it's saved temporarily like during the course of programming. 
And uh, here we have the history tab. So the history tab basically tell, like shows you all the commands that you've used so far since uh, you started opening R until like the time that you're using it. And then uh, this right here below has multiple tabs. Like we have uh, files, we have plots, we have packages and help. So the files uh, display like all the files that are like within the R, space, R workspace. The plots are gonna show you like all the plots that you've been generating during the course of programming. Um, the packages, the packages tab is gonna show you like all the packages that you've been you've installed so far. It also have it also gives like a user like an interface that shows you like oh where are the new packages that you haven't installed and everything. And then the help tab is really like the most important one because uh, it comes with a built-in R documentation. And this is a really important tool because this is where you're gonna like search the help if you don't know how any function work or like if you don't know how to use them, you can type in like the package name here and then it will give you like all the description, how to use it, or even give you an example. Okay. So next, let's talk about creating and deleting objects from memory. So um, R directly executes commands without requiring to build a, a complete co program. So all you need to do, you can go through your console where I told you like uh, where I told you like um, the commands are run. So you can go here and you can usually test the code immediately. So an example here, I just typed in one plus two, and then it gives you like three. But like the like um the problem with that like if you if you if you do this you're not gonna like this is not gonna be saved anywhere and for your results to be saved uh if you want to keep them of course like uh you will need to assign the value to a variable and to do that we use um assignment operators so we can either use an arrow written like this or you can use an equal character so for example, here I assigned uh, this, whole, this whole value to be named uh, N. You can name it however you want. And then, um, and then to, to, to run the command, you need to type in command plus enter. Like if you, if you just click enter, it's just gonna take you to the next line. So you need to make sure that you're hitting uh, command plus enter. And then you'll see your results uh, saved in the environment right here. So you'll see that the n, which is the variable that I assigned to the value and uh, the, the value here is three. Um, so that means that your results are saved. You also have the option to delete the objects in memory. And to do that, you basically use the function rm which means remove. And you can just type rm parenthesis um, and then type in the name of the variable that you assigned it to. You can also um, delete like multiple objects at the same time, depending on that. just make sure to put in like uh, the, the assigned variables uh, in bracket that you wanna delete. Okay. However, there are a few things to keep in mind. So R is a case sensitive language, meaning that uh, like capital letters are like, and uh, smaller letters are gonna be treated as two different objects. So like, uh, like I showed you how uh, N was saved as, uh, three was saved like as um, it was naming N. If I uh, did the same thing for capital N, I would see like two different objects, like uh, there are two different objects like on the, in the environment. So they are gonna be saved differently. So you really need to keep, um, to pay attention to that because uh, yeah, because like otherwise you'll be saving two different things. Um, and in our space does not matter. Uh, and they cannot like uh, the object names cannot contain strange symbols such as plus, minus, exclamation point, or pounds. However, a dot and an underscore uh, are, are allowed to use. And uh, the object names are okay to use, like they, they're okay to contain a number, but like they cannot start with a number. 
Okay, so now let's talk about the R help. So like I said, R has a comprehensive built-in help system. It gives you the online help tool that gives like very useful information on how to use the function. So it gives you like the whole description, uh, the, the usage, the arguments, how to use them, what do they mean? And it, it can also like uh, show you like an example. And the easy way, the easiest way to uh, to get our help is by simply type, typing in a question mark and the name of the function. So, for example, here I'm looking for mean. So I could have like typed in in the R console just question mark mean, and then you'll see like the whole description right here, like in the help tab. Or you can also do help uh, parenthesis and then put in a quotation mark and then put in min. Or you can do this way, uh, do the help and just put the name of the function into brackets. All of these three will bring you to the same um, to the same uh, page right here. Okay, now let's look on how to read data into R. So R is capable of reading data from most formats, including files that are created in other statistical packages. But before doing that, before loading a data set, you need to set the R working directory to the location of the data. And to do that, you go to these three points right here, like uh, remember the lower, um, lower uh, compartments that I showed you in R that is composed of uh, different tabs right here. So you're gonna go there, you're gonna see these three points right here. And then when you click on it, you can just do set as working directory. And if you don't know where to find a directory, you can simply use this command, get working directory. So it gets WD uh, like into your console. Okay. So here's like an example. Uh, for example, if you need to load the Titanic data sets, which is part of the R data sets, uh, you will simply do uh, use the function data and then type in like data parentheses and then the name of the function. And if you want the R data formats, you can simply uh, do the load and then parentheses Titanic. If you want a TXT like text formats, you do the red dot table and then you put titanic.txt. If you want a CSV format, you do red.csv and then parenthesis uh, titanic.txt. If you want a Stata format, you can simply load the foreign library using red.data and then the name of the function. So to save these objects in these formats, we use like uh, the write.table, write.csv, et cetera, and other commands. So this will uh, all make sense when uh, we run them, like we see examples when we're doing like the lab sessions tomorrow. Okay, so now let's talk about the R objects. So there are different types uh, of data types. Um, but the four basic ones are like numeric, numeric values, inte integers, uh, logical, and characters. So the numeric data type is basically like numerical values. These can be positive values, negative values, decimal values, uh, et cetera. And uh, first, I showed an example here. So here we're in the R console. I basically assigned the value of one to be named num. And to check the class of this, um, this uh, value right here, you basically do class and then parenthesis, you, you put in the name of uh, your value, and then it will show you the class the class type. So here the class type will be numeric. And then um, to verify if this is numeric, you simply do ease.numeric, and then you put in your name of your variable, your, your variable, which is num in this case, and then it will show true. And when you go to the outputs, like the environment, you'll see that the name is num, the type is numeric, there is one element and the value is one. 
So now let's talk about integers. So the integer data is used for integer values. So these are like all of the whole number values. And uh, to store a value as an integer, you need to specify as such. And what I mean by that, you need to use the as.integer function to let R know that, okay, so this is an integer. And uh, this is an example. So I set my value to be 20 and then I assigned it to the name of X. And then I, I do X as dot integer X. And then to check the class, you'll see that this is an, an integer. And then when you go to the environment, you'll see that uh, the, the, the name is X, the type is integer and the, it has a value of 20. Okay, so logical data type. So these are like Boolean uh, truth values. So it's can, it can either, either be true or false. You can also write it as uh, capital T or capital L, F, or like uh, you can write it like as the, as the, the words like true and false. So like, um, let's go through this example. So here I assign my value to be Y, uh, and then this is true. So when you check the class of Y, it shows you that it's logical. And if you check like, oh, is this logical? You do the is dot logical, and then the, the name of your variable, and then you show true. So that means like this value, this uh, variable here is um, logical. And then, um, and then uh, when you check the environment, you'll see that the name is Y, it has a logical type, it has one element, and the value is true. Okay, so characters. Characters are anything that is text, numbers, as long as like it's in uh, quotation marks. Um, let's talk about this example here. So uh, I chose an example, like I wrote in, uh, I love single cell. And then I assign this to be um, to be named Z. So when I check the class of Z, it's gonna show me, oh, this is character because it's in quotation marks. And you can also double check by doing is dot character uh, of the um, of the variable called Z to see like is this a character data type? And if it shows true, that means it's a character type data type. You can also double check in the environment. Uh, so we have the, the, the value here, which is I love single cell. Uh, it's a character data type and it's named Z. So there are a few things that you need to pay attention. You cannot put uh, like quotation marks inside of quotation marks, because if you do that, R is gonna be confused and it's gonna think that you forgot to close some quotation marks and you will see an error. So if you really wanna put like some quotation marks uh, inside of um, quotation marks, you simply uh, follow the quotation mark with a backslash like this. So I gave the same example. So you just simply put a backslash here just to tell R, okay, so this is a special character. And then it's gonna like treat it as if like it's a character and this will go through. Okay, now let's talk about the data structures. So the data structures are the objects that are manipulated regularly in R. These can be factors, vectors, lists, uh, data frames, and matrices. So we'll go through each one of them. So factors are usually seen as categorical variable. What I mean by a categorical variable is like a category. So it can be like a sex category. It can be like a letter, like alphabet category. It can be um, like numbers, like it's a categorical variable. And um, it can both store uh, the string and integer data values as levels. So here is an example. Like in the R console, if you type this, so to define a factor, you need to use the function as dot factor to, to, to let know R, okay, so this, I'm about to define um, a categorical variable. Um, so here, this example, I assigned uh, my variable to be named my factor, and I use the function as dot factor, and oh, one second. Sorry. And I use the function as dot factor. 
And I you, you need to put in um, some quotation marks and write in your categorical uh, variable. So, and this factor right here is gonna be a factor of one level. Okay, so now we just saw how um, like we, we can uh, we can use numerical data type, logical data type, um, lot, uh, character data type, factors. So we can also put uh, a bunch of character like character data type together, a bunch of uh, numerical data type together, or like factor data uh, factors like together. And when we do that, we create a data type called vectors. So vector can be defined as one of the basic data structures in R. It is homogeneous, meaning that it can only contain the elements of the same data type. So, and to create a vector, we basically use the function called C. And C stands for concatenate, which means putting things together. So we use this function right here. And then you can also do the same thing and check the class of to see like, is this a vector, yes or not? So let's go through like each data type that you can uh, convert in vectors. So we can, we can uh, do numeric vectors. So to do that, like I said, you use the function C. So I named my numeric vectors to be named uh, numeric underscore vectors. So this is the name that I chose. And then I, this is the name that I assigned. And then I use the function C. So remember numeric vectors are numbers. So I put in like some random examples of numbers. You can also create character vectors. So to create character vectors, you do the same thing. Uh, you go ahead and use the function C and uh, you put in the character, uh, the, the characters that you wanna use. As long as they are in quotation mark, that tells R that, okay, so this is a character. And these can be numbers, they can be like letters, they can be like uh, like words, just like we saw, but they need to, you need to, to tell R like, you tell R by putting in the quotation mark. And if you if you add the function C, that means it's gonna be treated as a character vector. So factor vectors, uh, these are the same way as uh, writing a, a vector of character. So remember the character vector, you write it like this. So to make it a factor vector, because remember a factor is seen as a categorical uh, variable, meaning that it has to be like, it has to be something related with ca a category. So in this case, I chose letters. Um, they are like, I need to put them uh, inside of quotation marks. And to define them as factor vector, I need to give the whole thing, like we use the function C to define a vector. And then to make it a factor vector, we need to add the function S dot factor. So this will be like a factor of five levels because there are five letters. In the case where like you would uh, find, um, I don't know, like A, B, and then B again, and then D, E, this will count as a factor of four levels. So it's gonna, it, it's gonna count uh, the letters as one level. And um, so, yeah. And uh, logical vectors, so you do the same thing. You, you put in the, to, to make a logical vector, you, you use the function C and uh, inside the parenthesis, you just put in the, 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 the logical values that you would like to assign. And like I said before, you can either use the capital F or uh, write it like in full words. Okay. There are certain rules that apply when you mix different data types together. Because remember, vectors like are homogeneous. So when you mix different data types together in one vector, certain rules are gonna be applied. So if you mix logical uh, vectors and numerical vectors, you're gonna end up with a data type that, that is uh, numerical vectors. If you mix logical vectors, numerical vectors, and character vectors, you're going to uh, end with a data type that, that is character vectors. So here's an example. Like I mix logical, so I called it so that it's easier to understand. So I called it a logic new vector. 
And uh, I'm about to mix like logical values and numeric values. So when I use the function C, I, I'm creating a vector. And I, when I put in one, which counts as a numerical vector, uh, when I put in a false, which counts as a logical value, this will be saved as a numerical vector. However, if I mix logical values, so in this case true, and numerical values, in this case two, and the character uh, value, uh, which is in this case x, I will get I will get it saved as character vector. Okay, so next let's talk about list. List is a non-homogeneous data structure. So list can contain anything as opposed to vectors. Vectors was homogeneous. List is non-homogeneous data structure. So it can contain anything. It can be like numbers, it can be characters, it can be lists, it can be matrices, or even if a function inside, inside of it. And to create a list, you simply use the list function right here as written right here. So I gave an example just to kind of get an idea. So I created um, my list function right here, and then I'm assigning it to be named my list. And uh, I'm gonna put in like, these are the, the, the variables that I defined earlier. So I'm gonna, you can put in numeric vector, you can put in a logical vector, you can put in character vector, you can put in a number in it. You can also put in a list inside of a list function. And you can also add a function. And when you run this, you're gonna see like um, a list of all the data types that you have, like how many elements you have, what kind of data types that you have, like what did you use? And it's gonna, like, we're also gonna see this uh, tomorrow when we run the code and you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Okay, now let's talk about the data frame. So data frames are like, it's a list of equal length vectors. And what I mean by that, it means that um, we use the vectors and they need to contain the same amount of elements because each element of the list can be thought of as a column and the length of each element of the list is the number of the rows. So I gave an example here. I defined a numeric vector. So I, I used the function C to create a numeric vector. And uh, these are my values. Uh, I used the function, uh, I used the, this name to create a logical vector. And these are the values that I have. So if you count here, so these are five elements. So it's one, two, three, four, five. And when you go to the logical vector, these are also five elements. There is one, two, three, four, five. And uh, so since these two vectors have equal length, that means like you can create a data frame. So like, uh, and to create a data frame, you basically use the function data.frame. So I assigned it to be named my data frame. And you basically put in uh, the variables that you assigned right here. So this is going to be numeric vector, which contain these values, and then the logical vectors, which contain these values. You can also label them. You can uh, be like x equals to numeric vector, and y equals to logical vector. That way you can keep it pretty well organized. Okay. Next, let's talk about matrices. So a matrix is a combination of two dimensional objects with the same data type. Um, so you need to put the same data type inside of a matrix. And to create a matrix, uh, you basically uh, put in the type of data that you want to use, and you need to assign how many like x row that you want to use and how much how, how many x column that you want to use. So here's an example. I used um, a character vector. I created these uh, values right here. So it's character because uh, it's in quotation mark, and it's a vector because I assigned it uh, the function. I put in the function C right here. So when you do that, once you assign the, your, your character vector and you wanna create, create a matrix, you're gonna uh, use the function of matrix, uh, put in the, the type of data that you want, assign the, the number of rows and also the number of columns. So we use n row 
equal, you can choose the number that you want and then end column and then choose the number that you want. And if you wanna check the class to, to make sure that is this a matrix, yes or not, you can simply put in a class um, and then you put in my matrix to just check the class. Okay. So let's do a quick review just to make sure that we're all on the same page and we understand uh, what we just talked about. Um, so there are like different data types right here. We have numeric data type, we have logical data type, uh, we have characters uh, and we have factors, which kind of counts as complex uh, data types. So um, these data types, what, so when you put a bunch of numerics together, logical together, characters together, factors together, that means you're defining a vector. Like, that means you're defining a data type, which is the vector. And then when you have um, when you have a list of vectors and you have equal length, that means you're creating a data frame. And uh, when you have uh, a combination of uh, two dimensional objects with the same data type, so you're gonna be able to create a matrix, just make sure to assign the number of columns and the number of, uh, of rows. And list, it can contain anything. It can be like vectors, and remember vectors can be numeric, logical, character, or factor. It can be a data frame, it can be a matrix, or it can also contain a list inside of another list. So I hope that makes sense, and thank you so much for listening. Is there any question? Does anybody has any question? I think you're getting a, um, a lot of thanks, Sarah. I see a lot of, uh, uh, sorry, um, see a lot of folks saying that it was quite detailed and very clear, but uh, we'll, we'll let people maybe sit with it for a minute or so. Um, will the PowerPoint be available today? Uh, Sarah, I'll, I'm not sure. If sure, like uh, if you want, I can send it. I'm, I can feel free to. Uh, hey, Sarah, you can just put it on the GitHub. Um, just give it to um, Daniel because he has okay. the uh, ownership over it. Maybe send it as a PDF, but yeah. And then we can post the GitHub link uh, in the Slack. Great. Okay. Sounds good. Oh, like ultimately you, everything will be on the GitHub, like the labs and the lecture notes. It's just we're kind of throwing it together as we go through these days still. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sarah. And maybe um, if people are interested, uh, seeing Colin's lecture earlier today and also Daniela's lecture. Um, maybe we can get those slides as well and post them on GitHub. Um, Colin, okay. I'm not sure if, if you'd be willing to share your slides as well. Yeah, I put them on the Google Drive, but I'm sure we can load them to the, to the GitHub. Great, but great. I, I can... I can drop them on the Slack channel as well. Maybe we can have a channel for resources. Excellent. Yeah, so I guess um, if you want to add it add it to the Slack channel and then maybe Sarah, was it Daniel that's loading it to GitHub? Is that right? That's yes. Correct. Yeah. yeah, Daniel has yeah. all the access um, to GitHub awesome. and he's taking care of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And then um, Elliot, do you want to touch base with Daniela for her slides? Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, I was also just going to say um, that, Sarah, I think I got a question that was meant um, to you, but just came to me as a direct message um, from Dan oh, yeah. participating. It asked if you can give uh, an example of two dimension with relationship to matrix. Oh, we'll see that tomorrow. Like I have an example in the lab. So this is just a PowerPoint lecture, lecture just to kind of like get an idea of how it works. But tomorrow we'll actually do like a demo to see how it actually works like in R. Perfect. So we'll be using like the R server. 
And thank you so much, everybody. Like, I got some people who are sending me direct message. It's so beautiful. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Looks like another question came in. Um, I think, Sarah, it's from Daniel. Maybe you want to read it out loud. Uh, uh, what is in the case where the object has X, say, and then defining Y metrics? think this is going to give an error. So when you're defining X right here, that means it's a vector because um, you're assigning it to the function of C and Y here will be counted as, oh, so you're asking me if you can create, oh, that works. No, it's not gonna give an error. Cause like, remember the mat matrix is basically, you, you just make sure to put one uh, data type inside of it. So X here is defined. Um, it will be like X here is like one data type. So this will be like numeric um, data type. And then you assign the, the X number of column and the X number of rows. So this is not gonna, this is not supposed to give you an error if that answers your question. I, I just tried it, Sarah, and you're right. It doesn't give an error, but it does give a warning because oh, yeah. um, there's five elements in the vector one two three four actually six elements oh. and you're declaring it with well this in this example it's being declared with two rows and columns so it does mm -hmm. give a warning maybe you can tell them the difference between an error and a warning in r that's kind of instructive so it, i'm not sure like i i always go forward when i see a warning like yeah. that doesn't stop me yeah like, exactly um, yeah yeah warnings are yeah. more like you might have done something that you didn't intend to do in r yeah. Um, but maybe it's okay and it's not gonna totally crash the code versus an error is like sending something to a function that it's completely not expecting mm -hmm. and isn't hand to, um, you know, set up the handle. And so the script will just stop versus with a warning, the script will just continue yeah. on. Yep. Does that answer your question, Daniel? Okay, great. And I think there is another question, not sure if you already um, addressed this, but how do you add new fields or columns to a matrix or data frame? Uh, you simply use the n call equal, and then you write in the number of columns that you want to assign it. And you can also use n row equal to the number of uh, rows that you want to assign it to. Cool. Any other questions? You should also feel free to take yourself off mute and um, show your face and ask us directly. Uh, we're friendly people, <laughs> right, Sarah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or feel free to even reach out directly to me. Um, I think my email will be like on the website, the HCA website. Okay, I just, um, if there aren't any other questions for Sarah, I do just have a couple of housekeeping notes for tomorrow. Um, and then I can turn it back over to the training leaders to close out the day. Does that sound okay, everyone? Yep. Okay, excellent. So let me just share my screen here. So I realize this morning, maybe some people had some issues logging on to join the broadcast. And um, I do wanna make sure that everyone was, was joining the right way. Um, so after receiving the confirmation email, you might've received a 404 error. Uh, just ignore the 404 error code message and then try reloading the actual website. And it should take you here and you should see join now um, broadcast link. To know that you're logged into the virtual event platform, you will see an icon here. If you don't see that, which I'm gonna sign out so you can see what that looks like, you will not see that, that icon. 
Um, so I, I hope that helps people. Um, can everyone, uh, I guess, did anyone try it that way and still run into issues? So to confirm, I'm just gonna walk you through the process one more time. So you're going to go to the event website. You're gonna log on. I will. I see a couple of people have their hands raised. I'm just gonna show this really quickly and then we can address hands. Log on. You're gonna check your email, which I'm gonna do now. Please just ignore my inbox. <laughs> I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna confirm my email address. I'm going to get an error code, but fear not, click out of that error code. And then I am going to go back here, refresh, and then I now am logged in and can join live. Okay, so I see, um, let's start with Daniel. I think you have your hand raised. Do you wanna take yourself off mute and ask your question, please? Yeah, so uh, thank you very much. After doing all that you said about, I reached a point of, I clicked the join now mm -hmm. and uh, had a message telling me that I didn't have the permission to join. Okay. Um, very strange. And you did you confirm that you were using the email address that you registered with, Daniel? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, um, if that happens tomorrow, I'm going to send the direct link to a new Zoom link, so don't worry. Um, please just check your email address in the Slack channel, but try first to join this way. Um, but don't worry, five minutes before our meeting starts, I will, I'll put the Zoom link in as well. So there's no need for anyone to panic. We'll make sure that you're in the room. Thank you. Sure, Daniel. Um, and then uh, I see... Uh, Akarut, I don't, Evelyn, is that right? You have your hand up, Evelyn? So Evelyn, I don't know if you can hear me, but if you, um, if you have a question, feel free to type it or take yourself off mute and ask the, the question. Okay. Um, all right. So please, everyone, just uh, try try joining tomorrow's broadcast the way that I just uh, laid out. And then if you're still, for some reason, not able to join, don't worry. Either Elliot or I will send the direct Zoom link to tomorrow's meeting in Slack and also over email. Um, the other thing that I want to bring everyone's attention to is I don't know if we have any developmental biologists or um, pediatric folks here in the room, but we do have a human cell atlas, uh, uh, developmental and pediatric cell atlas meeting um, uh, next month, November uh, 20th through the 22nd. It's happening in Paris, France. It will be hybridized, so the plenary sessions will be broadcast um, via live stream, um, but all of the breakout sessions and kind of poster sessions, those things, those will take place in person. Um, registration is closing this week, um, and there is still some travel scholarship monies available. So if you are a developmental biologist or a, a pediatrician, or if you just wanna learn more about the field and attend that meeting, please do register. I will drop the link in the, uh, in the Zoom right now. I think that's it for housekeeping, unless if Elliot, you have, if you have anything. Okay. Oh, and one more thing, we will post the, uh, the recordings to the event website, as well as on our YouTube channel. Um, in the next uh, day, I will say. So give us a little bit of time with that. Okay, um, maybe I'll turn it over to Collins and Orr uh, for the closing remarks of today. 
Yeah, sure. I can say something and then I'll give it to Collins. Um, so thanks everybody for, for joining today and asking lots of questions and keep asking us questions over Slack and, and through the Zoom chats tomorrow. Um, thanks to Musa, Collins, Vincent, Daniela, and Sarah for the really great kind of talks and getting all the R Studio stuff up and running. And so the next two days, we're really going to dive into the, uh, you know, showing, you know, in practice what, what Sarah talked about, and then really going into basic single cell analysis in R. Uh, and we'll kind of be alternating lectures and labs. And, you know, it's going to be pretty interactive and you're going to do a lot in R. So keep track of the questions you have and ask us all of them. And uh, yeah, so we're looking forward to seeing you over the next uh, three days. And uh, Collins, anything you want to add? <laughs> okay, I'll take that as a call. Oh, there's Collins. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I think Collins is okay, but <laughs> okay. So I'll leave it yeah, at I that. Think and Dominic can oh. say something. Uh, yeah. Um, I think this is one of the best um, workshops that I've seen so far because um, the presenters did very well um, in terms of the content. I really, even though I know some of the stuff already, I really enjoy the way they took their time to explain all the basics. So to the presenters today, um, good job. Uh, this also means we are probably improving on our skills in training other young people. So good job to Collins, Vincent, Daniela, and all those who presented today. Yeah, great. I think Collins and Vincent may add something small before we close. Yeah. No, I'm 